open. Get a grip on this operation, Heather. That's bored. Yes, sir. sir, I need more time. We have no time. Are you going to give that order or not? Sir, please. You are too naive to see the truth. There's no bringing in born. We will defend these police officers. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get to take the enforcement. But at the end of the day, each and every night, we go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be. Comply with the orders of police officers. Resisting arrest is a real and dangerous crime. Nonpartisan liberty for all. I'm your host, Dave Bourne, and it is October 12th. 2016 which i believe was the real columbus day not that that matters but uh we'll confirm that in a minute because i'm sure our resident historian uh ken shorgen who's joining us tonight can confirm that but i i remember it being on the 12th um actually sending me a, a message um So um welcome to nonpartisan liberty for all uh oh, thank you for tuning in to nonpartisan liberty for all coming to you live from Las Vegas um we're on weeknights, Tuesday through Thursday at 7 o'clock Pacific, 10 o'clock Eastern on that whole, sorry about that, that whole uh, message threw me off. Um, on <laughs> on the Armed Partisan Liberty for All Network, uh, radio, media and radio network. I fucked up this thing again, man. Actually, I, I just added that and I fucked it up two days in a row. Anyway. So on the Nonpartisan Liberty for All media and radio network, which runs now 24-7, and you can listen live on Spreaker.com and NonpartisanLibertyForAll.com. And to the archives immediately following the show on Spreaker, YouTube, Twitter, Tumblr, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and iTunes. On Nonpartisan Liberty for All, we promote the concept of self-ownership and the ideas of true freedom and liberty, meaning being able to do whatever you want as long as you respect the freedom of others and don't directly interfere with their freedom, exposing government for what it is, a mafia based on extortion that rules without consent by threat of force and violence. And we are happy to hear from you. Uh, You can reach us via phone at 702-470-7664 or via Skype at Nonpartisan Liberty for All. You can also check us out at nonpartisanlibertyforall.com, which links to our Facebook page, other social media and um, other stuff such as articles and or sorry um, original articles among other things and as well as blogs and stuff like that so um I guess we're having an issue with Ken hearing me. So let me bring Ken up. Oh, first, let me turn the fucking music off. Let me bring Ken up. Uh, so Ken, you're having problems. Um, Ken Shorjan from The Daily Economist and his own YouTube channel. Um, the Ken Shorjan is the name of the YouTube channel where he does uh, podcasts a couple times a week. So, Ken, you're having trouble... No, now I can hear you. Okay. Uh, Just from the intro to right when you were bringing me on, uh, it sounded like I I would get one word and it would cut off. And then maybe 10 words later you were speaking, I would hear one word and cut off. And then I was getting like two voices overlaid. So (laughs) don't know if what you were switching back and forth, but now you sound fine. Okay. As long as I'm good now. Um, 
then that's uh, we're good. Uh, so I had mentioned at the beginning that uh, I remember it was the twelfth, the original Columbus Day. I was just noticing that when I mentioned the date. Is that supposed to be the day that I, I I know it's probably not the real day any fucking way, but is that what they recognize as because they always did the Monday, you know, they started doing the Monday holiday thing, which is cool because um, a lot of people don't get Columbus Day off anyway. But if you do, you know, you get the weekend and the extra day. But wasn't the 12th like the the day that they claimed was Columbus Day or am I wrong on that? It's either the twelfth or thirteenth, but they they just pretty much much as they it's picked the 11th, a day 12th. or something. Yeah. All right, right. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention before uh, we get into Ken's stuff was I was watching this documentary on cannabis, which was pretty good, except that it had commercials. But I watched it on DVR, which is great because then you can fast forward through all the commercials, and it was um, actually. Uh, narrated by Woody Harrelson and he had um, he did a great job too and he's a big proponent of marijuana but one of the things I didn't know that I learned in the documentary uh, the former mayor of New York in the 20s and 30s and I think even into the 40s uh, Mayor LaGuardia he did a he was against prohibition he was also pretty much against the legalization or against uh, marijuana being illegal. Sorry. And he's the only one who actually in government, at least, I don't know what people did uh, regarding studies outside of government, but in government that I'm aware of at that time that did a study, a legitimate study with scientists and everything on marijuana and came back in 1944, I believe, with this uh, document that said, because they, they were putting out all this propaganda, you had, I can't remember the guy's name, but he was running what was the equivalent of the DEA, although it was under the tre- Treasury Agency um, at the time. It was under, I don't know why it was under tre- Treasury. I don't know, Ken, if you know why, but they put it under Treasury. Yeah, because... Um, because um because of the money part of it because no. because all drugs were taxed it was oh originally yeah, yeah, yeah. Before, before there was an income tax uh there were taxes on what they called sin taxes alcohol right. tobacco but they wouldn't get you had to have um i i know for for cannabis and even for uh heroin for a while or opiates that you had to have like this tax stamp that they government gave you but they wouldn't give them out so you so Essentially, for marijuana to be legal, you had to have this signed stamp by the government, this tax thing, and you wouldn't get one because they just wouldn't give them out. So that makes sense. Um, Right. So anyway, I didn't know that. So it's just an interesting fact to bring up. And he came back, of course, with everything, like I said, that, you know, it doesn't cause they were trying to say that, you know, marijuana causes people to murder, causes uh, more sex. I mean, that could actually <laughs> maybe in certain circumstances be true, but I mean, that's whatever. Uh, so does alcohol. Um, but it, you know, um, that it, it causes people to be violent and all this shit like that. So he had come, the study had come back and said, that's all bullshit. Uh, it didn't use those words. And then the, the guy who was running that agency uh, tried to discredit it and then totally, um, you know, ignored it and whatever and acted like it, it didn't exist. So it was just an interesting fact to to bring up um, that I didn't know. And then I was talking to Ken off air and he had brought up uh, uh, an interesting fact about him as well. If you want to mention that about what you told me uh, regarding uh, pr- running for president. Yeah, Fiorello uh, LaGuardia, I had it wrong. I originally thought he was a Democrat, but he was actually a Republican. And he was one of the last real constitutionalists before FDR. Yeah, because that, that would be weird back then, Democrats, because I thought about it after I said it, that Democrats in the 40s were like totally, they were, well, they still are. They just use different ways of doing it. But they were like racist and they were, you know, um, they were the same they are now, except they were totally like out in the open with it 
it. You know what I mean? They were more so to for a Democrat to be a constitutionalist back then would be pretty surprising. Yeah, well, yes and no. I I guess it depends. Yeah, because you know what? Starting in 1900, um, you've heard of the Progressive Era. Yeah. Which was from 1900 to 1920, where there were a lot of things of the Progressive Era that were actually good, like uh, getting rid of child labor. It's a matter of opinion. Well, getting rid of child labor. Um, cutting down work weeks at the, to yeah, yeah. 40 weeks. At, at the four, time, uh, but now it it, it affects uh, No, people. but today's progressives have nothing to do with those progressives. Right, right. No, but what I'm saying is at the time, it, it you know, some of those things were good, but now we don't have the same type of things going on. So it's like, you know, somebody that's 14 or 15 that wants to work – is restricted in their hours and stuff like that. and Yeah, but they weren't worried know. about that. The age, the age limit is 15. No, we're talking like seven, eight, nine-year-old kids who were forced into the, into right, the sweatshops right, true. But, of, uh, of, you know, the immigrants who were coming in from Ellis Island. They were being forced into, into that because you got to remember, too, a lot of the immigrants who came over didn't have any money. So they came right. in as indentured servants to people to – to corporations and companies bringing, you know, paying to have them come over between, you know, in the first two decades of the century. And, and a lot of people forget just, you know, because of what's going on uh, currently that they were heavily like Italians and Irish and whatever the immigrant the, the of the time, you know, because I guess there were influxes at certain times, right, of different countries of immigrants, um, immigrants coming from different countries, but they were discriminated against heavily. Um, there were places, you know, no Irish apply or no Italians or, um, people forget about stuff like that, but yeah, you know, the, the blacks won't tell you, but, uh, the, the Irish were actually treated far, far worse than the slaves were ever in, in the early American history. Why is that? You think that the Irish were treated so bad? Why? Because the Irish were not property, and mo- you know the, the the horrific things you hear about the the m- minimal slave owners that you know beat their slaves and and forced all this stuff. You know what? That wasn't widespread. Okay, the fact of the matter is is that it was it was prevalent, but it wasn't widespread. If you own property, that's money. You don't want to kill your property. You don't want to destroy it to the point that it can't work. But if you're an indentured servant like the Irish were, then you, you only have them for seven years, so you can work them to death, throw them away, and don't care. And that's why the Irish were actually treated far worse than the majority of blacks who were actually slaves and didn't have freedom. Yeah, you could, you know, the poor Irish, gosh, they were, you know, in the, in the British Isles, they were like uh, ranked third. You know the Brits, the the Brits were number one, the Scots were number two, and then the Irish were number three. And the Brits uh, messed around with the Scots, and then the Scots messed around with the Irish because they could. <laughs> you know, it was a right, sad right. state of affairs. It was like a pecking order, right? But um, but anyway, sorry, LaGuardia, back to the yeah. LaGuardia was uh was probably one of the last real constitutionalists. If you want to think about it, think about Scalia in. You know, in that time, he was uh, he was mayor of New York for three different terms between 1934 and 1945. So he was there for most of FDRs. And he you know, here's here's the fascinating thing about about LaGuardia is you just you just said Scalia. You meant LaGuardia. No, no, I said Scalia. You, Think, Scalia before Scalia died in the Supreme Court, uh-huh. Scalia was a dead set constitutionalist. Everything that he. Oh, you said much, think of Scalia. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, if you want a comparison for him, think right, of right, I see what you're saying. Thing. Right. Um, so anyway, uh, Laguardia was actually born Jewish, who became a Catholic, and had a uh, Iri- or a, an Italian name, and he never he never you know went out of his way to to use his Ju- uh, Judaism. He just let everybody think he was Italian. But uh, yeah, he was he was a big that despised prohibition because he went he became mayor of uh, New York after prohibition was uh, was removed in 1929, 
I think it was 1919 to about, no, 1932. 1919, 1932, uh, I believe was Prohibition, that, that decade era. Anyway, he got into office after that was done, and he saw the effects of what Prohibition, and he realized you cannot, you cannot legislate morality. You just you just put it into right. the criminal element when you do that. And he was uh, he seems like somebody that was in a way, see in a way not, but in a way yes, like he was ahead of his time, but in a way he wasn't because if you go back further, then you know all of these things were legal anyway, and you could buy them right off the fucking shelf. So, uh, but at least for the time period. He was somebody that was doing things that nobody else uh, in government uh, were doing. So I, it's just something For I wanted to part, mention. He was incre- he was incredibly uh, popular, and he was going to run for the Republican ticket, uh, but that was still a time where Protestant America uh, had this fear of having a Catholic president. Um, you know, JFK came in at the time when Vatican II was just about to be done, uh, be passed, and there, there was a little bit more leniency. But there was a fear by most of the Protestants in America that if uh, a Catholic became president, his first allegiance would be to the right, Pope right, and right. the Vatican of Rome. So that's why a Catholic, there was only been one Catholic who's actually... Yeah, become president. Even to this day, Kennedy was still has still been the only Catholic. Basically, the only non-white Anglo-Saxons, although the early presidents, there there's some disputes as to... Um, They're mostly deists. They're mostly yeah, deists. And, they believe in God, but they don't believe in any religion type thing towards it. Towards it. But there were some. I, I thought there were some disputes in in what they totally were. Anyway, but besides that, I mean, if you you know, really, the only two presidents that weren't uh, wasps in the past, you know, whatever hundred years or something like that, were Kennedy and Obama. So it's uh, it's just a kind of interesting uh, fact there. But anyway, there's a lot going on. Um, Especially since we, uh, I, I was off last week. Well, not for the whole week, but for Wednesday, um, and we didn't get to do the show. So there's been a lot uh, going on. So I also listen to uh, Ken has his show on YouTube at uh, Ken Shorjan. So you can listen to his his show, which does air live when you do it as well, right? Because I've seen it say live now. I never clicked on it when it said live now. Oh, but. yeah. I, I live stream it, and then it processes maybe 30 minutes later. It's up up on there um, as just a regular YouTube. But, yeah, I do a live stream. Do you um, always do it at the same right. time or no. just – okay. No, I don't, I don't do that. Um, so it's more – you to catch the live stream, you just got to be lucky. <laughs> yeah, if I'm, I'm usually doing it between like 8 and 11, sometime there. Uh, because my primary thing, of course, is to you know get some articles out, check all the news, go through all my sources and that, and then and then build up in my mind what I want to talk about and and then lay it out. So usually, you know, and if I've got something I got to do in the in the morning, well, you know, and I and I told people when I did the podcast, um, I'm not going to uh, hold it to every single Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Right, there may right. be times that you know there was time like I've got a Thursday night pool league. And if I'm out late, uh, you know, and I just don't feel very good in the next morning or feel like doing it, I won't do it on Friday. But I also will do special events. Um, I did a special uh, podcast on a Thursday when the Deutsche Bank uh, crisis was uh, was heating up. And I also did one that uh, weekend because it was going to be the end of the Shemitah. And there was a convert. There was a convergence of three different things. Um, the China, Chinese uh, yuan was getting put in the SDR on that day. Uh, the JASTA um, legislation had just been, you know, overridden the veto in Congress. So were the were the Saudi Arabia, you know, was Saudi Arabia going to go ahead and just dump all of their U.S. assets? And then, of course, Deutsche Bank was still going strong then. So there was a convergence on that day, and I did a special podcast. I 
I think you can also, uh, in your settings, like you might be able to set, not you, but I'm saying to the audience that you might be able to set up, um, I think you can, that it will let you know when it broadcasts live, uh, when somebody is broadcasting live, if you want to set it up that way. Um, I believe, I'm not 100% sure, but. Yeah, um, if, you, if, you go to, if you go to the channel. I know it will let you know when there's a new going- show. But sorry, no, if you go, go to the channel, if you go to channel, it'll show you that something's already in progress live. Oh, yeah, yeah. It will definitely show you that. But what I'm saying is you I believe you can even set it up in your own YouTube settings that if a live show is being is on, that it will let you know. It will alert you as to not you, but it will alert the user. So the so if a person um, subscribes to your channel in the settings that they can choose to be alerted when you post a new show, but also when you're live. Right. So I believe that that's there as well. So, yeah. And the funny thing about a live show is, uh, you know, if I really wanted to, I could, there's a little chat room and I always find out at the end of the show when I'm done and, uh, you know, back in focus to, uh, to save the settings, to save it. I'll see in the chat room. There'll be about 10 people or just BSing back and forth on the things I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, the chat room um, is different from, just so everybody knows, from the comments. They have uh, a chat a chat room up there as well. But in the comments section, the ones that I read, you've got a lot of, we've mentioned this before, i got a lot of positive um, comments. Um, I haven't really seen any negative ones. Um, oh, no. Not- and, and it's what, what's, what I, I really find, uh, get a kick out of is, um, I must be doing something right because out of like 32 podcasts or 33 podcasts I've done since uh, the beginning of August, I think I've had a total of maybe seven or eight uh, dislikes for, for, you know, all 33. So normally, normally it's uh, about 45 likes and maybe, maybe one dislike, but yeah, that's pretty good. So, and and sometimes a lot of people just don't, press that especially if they're not listening and they're lo- they're logged in and they're listening um or they're i mean they're not logged in because you have to be logged in to press on the like thing so a lot of times a lot of people just won't even press that so you there's probably a lot more people that would press like it's just because i do that i'll watch something and i'm if I'm, i don't ever press the like if i like it and they, but that's partially because I have my YouTube channel and I don't want everybody to see all the shit that I press the like on because it's more of a, you know, putting my shows out there. But that's a whole nother issue. But anyway, um, I never used to press it before. It's just even if I like the show. Um, anyway, one of the things I wanted to uh, bring up that I know you have a lot of insight into. And I was mentioning to you off air that uh before I, I turned it off, I caught like a minute or so of douchebag Bill O'Reilly um, mentioning this, that the hack into the, was it the Democratic Party or Hillary specifically? Because I know uh, oh, there's there a number of things. both. So, there, there's been, a, there, the original the original one was hacks into the DNC. Right, right. And they tried to blame Russians, but uh, Julian Assange came out and sort of inferred that uh, it was it was a DNC staffer named Seth Rich, who ends who, up who ends up dead. dead. Yeah, who was yeah. shot uh, <laughs> a couple of days later, and um, and then the later the later ones were a hack of uh, uh, Guccifer is uh, taking credit for hacking the Clinton Foundation. And I don't know if I mentioned this, but uh, if you go do the search on the Guccifer for the Clinton Foundation. He took screenshots of all the folders that are on that, you know, all the database in there. And one of the folders actually is labeled pay to play. Nice. And and that, that actually comes from the, I believe the first time was in what, the 50s or 60s when they used to pay the DJs to uh, play the albums. So they... Yep. Be a get heard. I know. I only know that because of you know my BA in film and having and the, to and take mo- media the, classes. The most recent uh, ones that Julian Assange been putting out in in massive dumps are the hack of John Podesta. Not don't be um, which which mista- mistaken with uh, uh, Panetta. Yeah, but j- real quick, John Podesta is also. Uh, I did a show yesterday 
about the UN and talked about, and I mentioned this to you as well, the document uh, that the sustainable development until 2030, the representative from the United States happened to be John Podesta, just so everybody right. uh, he, knows that as a, well. He's the campaign head of, uh, of the Clinton campaign. Right. And uh, immediately, uh, you know, and what's, what's kind of funny is, is that he went crying to the FBI and now he's trying to, trying to get the FBI to really look into it when uh, the FBI didn't even bother with Hillary's crap, you know, which was treasonous. But the interesting thing is, is now Podesta is going out of his way to try to put the blame on everybody, including the Russians. And in a uh, today in the Hillary before, press, press camp. Uh, so, sorry, just before you get to that, I just wanted to finish what uh, O'Reilly said that, um, as you said, the, the Russians, that they're claiming they have. I only caught like a like I said, like a sentence of it, but. He, I, I believe he said that there's proof and he's criticizing Obama because he said Obama should come out and uh, say something and attack the Russians because this was an attack by the Russians. And I've also heard, uh, speaking of Russia, like they're saying that Julian Assange is in with Russia now and all of this bullshit. And, and Julian Assange... Um, what I've seen of him, and I watched the the movie, and I've seen documentaries on him as well, which are uh, a lot more accurate than a movie, but even documentaries are slanted to whoever's doing the documentary, but that he's pretty much just wants to get information out there, that he doesn't really take an opinion as far as, you know, uh, politically uh, just that governments are doing things they shouldn't be doing and i'm exposing that or they're lying about it and i'm exposing that yeah where, where was bill o'reilly back in uh 2015 when edward snowden revealed that uh the u.s was hacking an ally angela merkel's phone and here's here's the the quote the allegations were some of the most stunning to emerge from the documents leaked by former NSA contractor Edward Snowden. The White House never outright denied spying on Merkel, but it did say that it was not currently spying on her phone and would not do so in the future. So this isn't just a matter of this is this is a the U.S. spying and hacking a world leader, an ally's phone, right? And they have the audacity to question when Russia or, you know, if, whether Russia did or didn't when another country hacks into U.S. databases. Well, I think most people know, uh, if you've listened to the show before, know that I, I can't stand O'Reilly. And I used to watch him because I couldn't stand him so I could fucking scream at the TV. Don't I, I think I like to subject myself to pain in certain ways because – I watch. I, I haven't been doing it. I, I because it's just too fucking aggravating for me. So I, I'm trying to stop doing it. But I I stopped TV wise, of finally, and I still did it on the radio, driving to and from work. And I've been stopping that as well. But I would listen to these people that I can't stand, and I would just sit there, yelling at the fucking radio or thinking whatever in my head how how much this is bullshit. Uh, so, but when I, Jesus, years ago, I used to watch all of those shows and just it, the, the conservatives or the, uh, progressives, whatever you want to call them, you know, no matter which one I was watching was full of shit and I would just fucking scream at the TV and, um, I, I it just makes me too fucking angry, but er yep. everybody knows that I think Al O'Reilly's a douchebag and most people, I think, that uh you know would listen to the show would think that unless you do the same thing i do and listen to my show because you can't stand me and and want to say he's full of shit or something look there, there's an axiom that i always go by when somebody says with emphasis that they are or aren't something then i assume that they are you know the no spin zone bull crap i know like yeah exactly that, 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 he has that, to tell people that 
emphasize there's no spin just like fox uh fair and balanced <laughs> right exactly. they say it over and over when, again when you, when you make a byline what you're doing is you're trying to project into people's minds hey we don't do that even though we do that now here's something fascinating on a side trick um at a trump rally uh the because of the how how bias the last debate was you know both of the moderators were actually debating trump yeah, trying, I'm not a. Yeah. You know how I feel about Trump right. and the I'm debates, just, just saying, but I, I, but I'm, I, no, I want to say something real quick because I, I, I do agree with you though um, on that statement. I, I can't stand Trump or Hillary, and I don't believe you know the whole system's rigged and run by right. you know whoever. But, but yeah, I, I do agree with you on that point because. I happen to I'll only listen to the debates because I'm at work and I I talk about this that I have a job where I work independently. So I'll listen to it, you know, because it can play through YouTube and I'll listen to it while I'm working. So that's the only reason I listen to the debates. I am not going to go out of my way to fucking spend the time to watch them. But, yeah, I I agree with you that they they were definitely uh, biased. Yeah, well, the people are finally waking up to it. Because at the Trump rally, either today or yesterday, uh, Trump didn't start this, but a, the whole there was like a few, uh, you know, maybe twenty thousand people there, and they started in unison. CNN sucks. CNN sucks. CNN sucks. And uh, of course, CNN played this, and it wasn't and- even on CNN. But I know Anderson Cooper was one of the debaters, uh, or not debaters, moderators. Was the other lady from CNN too? Because it was on like NBC, but they had Anderson Cooper and um, the other lady I didn't know. Yeah, Eliza Quintilla or something. Is like she that. a CNN? I, per, uh, she's anchor? not CNN, but she's definitely from from one of the the left leaning rags. But the point is, is that CNN when they heard about this, they started excoriating Trump. You know, how dare you not stop and tell them to shut up? <laughs> you know, oh, why? why? I mean, what the exactly. fuck? People can say what they want. It's and like because the the mainstream media, you know, see, here's the thing. This is this is why Podesta is 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 also furious mad. Because inside the Podesta emails, it was discovered that dozens and dozens of media and media personalities I, i.e. CNBC's John Har- and, and uh, Wall Street Jour- or New York Times John Harwood. He was communicating directly with Podesta, and every time that uh, Podesta wanted them to do a story, they would filter a story that they wrote, that Hillary's campaign wrote, to Podesta, and he would pretty much read it on air. Nice. So most of the media is in communication with and receiving news and reporting news directly from the the Hillary campaign. That tells you all, anything you need to know about mainstream media. You know, it, it's gotten to the point you don't try to figure out who's good, you just assume they're all bad. Well, I I think that their agenda is the agenda of the powers that be, and that's why. I mean, I mean And, and now the- and now you know also why all those Republicans after the the sex tapes came out. By the way, there is a rumor. You you know whether you like Donald Trump or not, that's 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 here nor there. Donald Trump is a buffoon. But the one thing that's absolutely uh, rock solid sure is Donald Trump is not part of the establishment. After the sex tape came out, and there is now a strong evidence growing that you know who actually leaked the sex tape. The campaign manager of Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. That's nice. I know it was, uh, they had it for years. It was what, NBC that had it? Um, Because it was from his show. It was from The Apprentice, which aired. No, 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 no. You know what this whole thing was about? This is. uh, Well, no, but I'm saying it came from The Apprentice, right? Didn't it come? It did not. It did not see this. Let me, let me give you the whole context because that's the problem is they didn't give the context. Back 11 years ago, Donald Trump was doing a cameo appearance on Days of Our Lives. Oh, okay. 
Okay. Because they made it sound like it was from The Apprentice that he was talking to a cameraman on the set of The Apprentice. No, they're saying that they're coming. No, to be honest, I didn't get. I I avoid all these fucking stories because I could care less. It's it's all everybody talks about, and I'm so fucking sick of it. So I I heard it, but I didn't even. It's just like whatever. But but go ahead. Okay. Anyway, he was doing a cameo on Days of Our Lives, and guess what? In the cameo, get this. His cameo, the show, was a woman, he was playing himself, by the way, a woman came up to him in, in the days of our lives and said that, uh, you know, I, I, hey, I, you know what, I've co-CEO'd companies, I've did this, I really want to work for you. And she then implied, I will do anything for you if you hire me. So in essence, she was selling herself out. Right, she'd uh, yeah, that was, bl- blow that was for, life. yeah. And 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 uh, before that, this conversation with Donald Trump, with Billy Bush, who worked for Access Hollywood, now works for well, used to work for NBC. He's actually a cousin of the Bush family. Oh, and is, uh, is that that Bush? No, well, he, <laughs> he, he's not one of the big ones. You know, he just but he's he's related to that uh, by Bush. marriage or by something like that, or cousin or something like. That. Anyway, they were just BSing. And it got to shop talk because Billy Bush was sort of egging him on. And, and because they knew, you know, Bush, I mean, uh, Trump knew that he, the, the episode he was doing was about a woman who was throwing herself at him because he was rich. He went on and t- started telling Billy Bush, oh, yeah, this happens in real life. You know, I, I get to go to, uh, you know, do this and, and women – come at me all the time and you know as a matter of fact this uh, actress who uh, i'm going to be working with i you know i i liked her one time i wanted to date her she turned me down but you know i would and it just got locker room talk well here's the thing right. about it you know, you know what the biggest hypocrisy of this is is um do you remember how many pe- how many women went absolutely gaga for uh 50 shades of gray where women, you know, the do you know what that book's about? Yeah, I I didn't read the book. However, my fiance read the book, told me a bunch of stuff about it, and I did see the movie. The movie doesn't really do the book justice, and as no. far as and, and and I'm saying that in a kind of you know 80, 80 facetious way. Copies were bought, yeah, by it, women who wanted to be. Uh, dominated and yeah yeah. dominated okay and 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 extremely uh, like in the movie they don't show the extremes of the book because i heard some of the book from my fiance and they and they it's not as extreme in the movie as it is in the book just so people know you know if they just because i just seen the movie but i heard parts of the book from her but yeah so it's it goes even further as far as the domination and what she'll take just to be with him um that she keeps taking all this shit that she doesn't even want to do and what was what was the liberal feminist anthem well it was written by a woman so uh no 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 I'm i'm moving to something else uh, a few years ago, on Broadway, what was the absolute feminist liberal woman's anthem? Oh, the, the vagina monologues? Bingo! Where you talked about it in every glory detail. Now, you're going to tell me that you're going to be upset when guys in a locker room talk about women the way that women talk about themselves or talk about men or talk about, you know, whatever – it was absolute BS. Well, I said this last night because, and we're kind of getting off topic, but it, that's fine. Um, we'll get back to the Russia thing. But um, I had said this last night when I was looking at, you know, the UN agenda. And, of course, one of the things is equality. Now, that makes sense when you're talking about the whole world because, of course, you know, women are treated very badly in other countries. But if you're talking about the United States, it, it – it, there is not a I don't see an equal an inequality issue because there are certain benefits that women have that men don't and certain benefits that men might have that women don't um, none that come to mind off the top of my head but I'm sure I could come up with some but point being that it all it all evens out that you know women and men uh at least in the United States now if you want to talk about like Iraq or something or some of the Muslim countries, okay, you have a, a huge 
point there. But if you're talking about the U.S., it's ridiculous. It's like women are third-class citizens. That's not the reality. I know so many women that are directors at companies. Um, I know, you know, and it's not even that. It's women have benefits that men don't. Beautiful women can get by on their looks alone. I mean, uh, you know, j- just because you're a good-looking guy, it will help you. Don't get me wrong, but not to the extent that it will help a beautiful woman. There's no, so there, so there's there, so many things. There, there, because because men men want certain things. Men are more physical. Okay, they the looks stand out more than the personality in that. But what does a woman want? A woman wants security over looks and over that. So right. if, you know, this is this is why but you point, get gold, point gold being, diggers. Trophy wives and those who are willing to marry the ones that marry Trump, (laughs) the ones that marry Trump. But yeah, point being is that, you know, there are certain biological differences and you can't ignore that. But when it comes down to it, women in the United States are treated equally as as equal as you can be. They have equal opportunity. Put it that way. That one women of, uh, have equal opportunity in the United States. Are women sometimes discrim- discriminated against? Yes. Are men? They are too. I mean, I've seen incidences of that as well. And I've seen uh, there was just real quick this guy Joey Salads, um, who some of the stuff he does I kind of like. Some of the stuff I don't. But he he does like experiments where where he'll do like. Uh, he did a thing with kids and and asked the mother at the play you know playground like can i go up to your kid and see if you know they'll come with me if i um you know try to talk to them and and the mothers were like he asked them you know you tell them not to talk to strangers right and they're like of course and all the kids went with them and they're like shit you know so one of the things he did was he had a, a girl you know uh in the mall pushing him and grabbing his ass and telling him uh, he she wanted sex and whatever and he's like no leave me alone i don't want to have sex with you and no one ev- no one said anything except uh they either like said oh you're a pussy you won't have sex with her or the the girls were like yeah like it was all shit like that nobody stopped it or said you know why don't you leave him alone but when he did it to her of course Everybody came over and and stopped them and like, what the hell are you doing? You can't treat women like that. So, I mean, there's double standards in so many aspects, but it it evens out. Right. Well, here's here's the interesting thing. Okay, Um, and I'm going to take what you said and and disprove an absolute lie, one that uh, the Democrats use uh, to try to emotionally stimulate their base. Okay. The, one of the big things that uh, that Hillary and all the liberals love to say is that is there's the an income, money, the in, income, income inequality co- with between men it's, and women. It's bullshit. It is bullshit. And uh, uh, a black uh, economist by the name of Thomas Sowell, well known, well respected, disproved it because what ends up happening is is that they think, okay, uh, this woman's in a job and this man's in a job. She's making 70 cents on the dollar to what he's making. But they never put in the entire context. Okay? It, yeah. N- normally, yeah. normally when exactly. you work for a company, okay, if you've been in similar positions, say the woman gets in, she's been there for a year, and the man's been a vice president in whatever for 10 years. Exactly. Guess what? He's going to make more That's, because well, that, each year he gets cost of cost of living allowances for 10 years more than she did. Well, there's so gonna, many other things, and I've said this as well, that, you know, experience factors in. Um, all these – the only way you can look at that is you would have to take the qualifications exactly of every single person and compare all of these things. You know, the school you graduated from, the experience you have, the uh, recommendations that you got, the – you know what I mean? There's so many yeah. things. You can't just say, well, this position and this position because it doesn't work that way. Exactly, and let me let me give you these uh, statistics, and they're absolutely dead on. As far back as 1971, single women in their 30s who had worked continuously since high school earned slightly more than men of the same description. As far back as 1969, academic women 
who had never been married earn more than academic, academic men who had never been married. The key thing that uh, w- women – this is one of the big differences between women and men working in the, in the uh, world. Women as a group do get paid less than men as a group, but not for doing the same work. Women average fewer annual hours of work than men. They work continuously for fewer years than men, since only women get pregnant and most right, women... Right, a lot know, of women leave, will leave uh, the right. career for a while and come back, or, you know, there's all these variables that factor into it. So that's why I said, you know, unless you're going to show me a specific example, and that would only be one example anyway. Um, now, if you're talking about, if this was like the 20s, then you know or i don't know maybe the 40s or something which actually the 40s women got a lot of work during the the war but you know if if you're talking more than 50 or 60 years ago uh you know that's a different story but to look at things now it, it's so fucked up how there's all these issues coming up now that were issues at some point but they're not the issues they were then there, you know what I mean? It's like with that, that was an issue at, at one point that women didn't have the same rights men had. They couldn't vote. They, they didn't have all the same rights. But that's not an issue now. But now they want to bring it up. It's but it, just, but it's, and you know what? It's not just it's just not and it, just it's because of an agenda. It, it's it's I know it's not just women. It's it's a bunch of things. Let, but let, it, let it's me, because me, of an agenda. Uh, and, and to me, one of the agendas is if you were to do that. And, and and this is just my opinion if you want to look into it deeper but you know if you passed a law like that that you had to pay first of all one of the things they have to do and they had to do this when they created my position because i had a position created for me because i was going to leave my job whatever like four years ago i had gotten another job and i was going to leave and they wanted me to stay but um they had to actually create all these details and look at another job and how much that got paid even to pay me what they wanted to pay i mean it's really fucked up and what it will do is it will give the government more control over businesses and it will allow them more access to all their information well it's it's also something else it creates division. Well, okay? Okay. well, as that that, as, that that I think is obvious that they're trying to create division. But, see, but you're right. As everybody, definitely. everybody is divided and worrying about what their male counterpart is earning, or you know, right. Let me let me read this about the about the black and white situation. It is much the same story with black and white comparisons. More than forty years ago, my own research turned up statistics on black and white professors who had PhDs from equally high-ranked institutions in the same field. When all things were held constant, the black professors earned somewhat more than white professors, but since all these things are not the same among black and white professors in general, there is a racial gap in pay that allows some to loudly denounce racial discrimination against academics. This is the problem, is when you talk about incoming inequality, it is nearly impossible to to put apples to apples. Yeah, but I, I, they're not saying, I think, that black people in the same jobs as white people are getting paid less money. They're saying that black people should uh, are in lower jobs, but they should be paid more money. Well, which no, is, it, no, what it, no, what it's also saying is this, okay? Because let's take, let's take uh, teaching at a university level, okay? What are the criteria for, for being a tenured professor? One... You have to get like a master's or a PhD. We'll assume, we'll assume everybody's got a PhD. That's fine. Secondly, you've got uh, number of years worked, number of classes you're willing to teach, but most importantly, what is the one thing universities want if they're going to make a professor tenured? You have to publish. Okay. And not everybody is prolific in publishing. And those who publish are going to get paid more by the university. You mean like publishing uh, articles on whatever you're teaching and stuff like that? Uh, I'll give an example. <clears throat> publishing a white paper, uh, doing research. You know, Google was created in, in a Stanford lab. It was, it was a project for the university. The university, the, the kids get, you know, the, the two, two guys who uh, created Google got to um, take it public, but the university gets a portion 
like they have a bunch of shares or whatever in the right. company because it was it was, it was created, created using lab. that type of thing. Well, at some but, point they got money from the uh, the Pentagon's um, DARPA too, but that was yeah, exactly. later. But that's the point is is that not everything is apples to apples. Let me give another example. Right, right. I think it was it's, I think it was it's in not. Maryland. That's... I think it was in Maryland. Okay, you had an, a group of firefighters, black and white. Okay, the white ones for the most part had. I think 60% of the firefighters at a certain level had a college education. Only 20% of the black firefighters did not. There was a standardized test, okay? The white white uh, firefighters did much better on that standardized test because they were more educated and had more expensive background. They got promoted. The black The black firefighters screamed racial discrimination, and eventually the standardized test got thrown out. Now... Um, why should somebody who has taken the time to have more skills and more value to their job get paid equal or less to somebody who who doesn't? That's what I'm saying about apples to apples, oranges to oranges. Um, you know, that's the problem when you try to put, you know, what is equality? Equality is another name for socialism or communism. Yeah, no, it is. And that's in what I had talked about yesterday with the UN that, it, and, and uh, I brought up the story of Harrison Bergeron. Um, I think I might've asked you this before, but have you ever heard of it? It's a short uh, story by Kurt Vonnegut. They made it into a, a Showtime TV movie with Sean Austin. Um, anyway, what, what it was about was it was, they actually literally made people equal. So the intelligent people would have to wear these things on their heads that made, you know, that, that made them, uh, not as smart. And if you were better looking, you had to like wear a mask or something or, you know, things like that, that they literally made everybody equal. The president was picked by lottery and Essentially, the government was really run underground by it was like an oligarchy. And Harrison Bergeron ended up becoming part of the government because he was so smart that he broke the thing that they tried to use to uh, lower his intelligence. He was just too smart and it just kept fucking breaking. And from what I remember, I read the story when I was younger and I seen the movie like, you know, whatever, 20 years ago. But um at the end, <laughs> Sean Austin, who plays Harrison Bergeron, shoots himself in the head on TV. Everybody stops for a minute, looks at it, and then just continues on with what they're doing because everybody, you know, doesn't care. It, they're all been made equal, and it's kind of like now, like, you know, people here, they're spying on you. They read the story, and then they're just like, oh, okay, whatever. Um, it, it, it really makes a lot of sense now um i tried to look up real quick while i was on the air like what the meaning because i had heard kurt vonnegut was possibly like more libertarian or whatever and i'm not sure i i, I don't know if you how much do you know about him i don't know a lot about him i just heard you know things here and there and it, it said he did write some uh, geopolitical stuff and uh that he based it on more of a satire, you know, about now, the Cold now, War. Who's this, who's this? Kurt Vonnegut. Oh, yeah. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, I don't know if you remember a movie uh, back in 2002 called Equilibrium. Yeah, I do. It was uh, it was Bale. with Christian Bale and um, that uh, Tay Diggs. I talked about that last night, too. Where it's they very made, they similar made them, because... Yeah, they made them take they, pills uh, to, to... Eliminate emotions exactly. and feelings. And that's how they made everybody equal. Yeah, because they wanted to eliminate anger and hate. And they said, okay, well, uh, along with all the other emotions, but, you know, it's the flip side anyway. Like, you know, love is the flip side of hate or whatever. But, yeah, that's how they, they got rid of people's emotions. And they said, we can eliminate war. We can eliminate, um, you know, all of these things. And I thought I I actually thought of that, and I mentioned that yesterday. There's another movie uh, called Equals, which is similar, where what they do is is before the baby is born or while the baby is developing, they this is what I understood uh, it, how they did it was they removed like their emotions, but it didn't 
I guess, take on a lot of people or they, they couldn't stop it. A bunch of people de- ended up developing emotions and they called it a disease and they tried to cure the disease. And what would happen is they'd have stages. And once you get to a certain stage, they'd kill you. Right. Um, and yeah, the person yeah. would be all depressed because they were different than everybody else. But it was really the same thing. It was it, it was called Equals, I think, was the name of the movie. So, it, And this is a pretty recent movie. Um, Kristen Stewart's in it as well from uh, Twilight. But, it's yeah, it's, it's what they really want to do is make everybody equal. Now, people are not made equal nobody is equal Uh, the goal is to be treated equally under the law as much as possible but people are not equal i'm not everybody looks you know some people are better looking than others some people are you know smarter than others some people uh, have physical abilities that others don't have and you know there's so many things you know it's a perfect movie to throw out the 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 stuff that you know if just because you're born with uh you know low intelligence or some type of ailment means that you're going to be a failure you remember uh, Forrest Gump here's here's a kid who had a 70 IQ who uh had a uh, uh problem with his spine and yet he accomplished well, he had those things on his uh well, on his they, legs they, yeah, they did the braces because he had a, he had a spine. spine problem, and the braces were supposed to make him stand up straight to uh, help his, fix his spine. But what they ended up doing was making his legs absolutely super strong because of the way he had to walk. But the point is, is that here's somebody who, you know, was born into this world without the same opportunities, you know, equal opportunities as everybody right. else. But it doesn't matter because you can succeed beyond all your wildest dreams if you work towards it well that's and, right the, it, so, sorry to but interrupt but that, that that's, that's, that's the, the whole point is that, is that right. some, some people have it harder and i will say in general and i've said this before i i mean racism has not been eliminated their racism exists not like it used to but it does exist and i think in general and I say in general because there are plenty successful black people. Just because government media wants to show every ghetto black person on TV and not show all the intelligent black people. Um, I mean, they show some on some of these show, unless you're a political analyst or something. But, you know, when they're interviewing the sh- person on the street, it's somebody who can barely speak, you know, proper English and whatever. But, you know, obviously... It, we don't live in a world where black people cannot be successful because there's plenty of examples of it. And there are probably more successful black people than not than unsuccessful black people. It's just that's what they want you to think. But the point being, I think in general, it's a little harder. But you still have to overcome, you know, if you're born in a poor, you know, in the projects or something like that. Or, you know, you're born in whatever circumstances, you know, everybody has different circumstances. I wasn't born rich. I wasn't even born, you know, middle. I I don't know that I would consider myself middle class. I never even lived in a fucking house until I bought one. And, um, you know, I I didn't go. uh, I had never been on a plane until I was like 22. I mean, my father drove cabs and was a cab dispatcher. And. You know, everything that I have, I earn myself. And that's why when people try to say this whole privilege thing, there are privileged people. Don't get me wrong. But it's not based on race. It's based on individuals that there are individuals that are privileged, that have rich parents that are, you know, able to give them all this shit. But, you know, I went through, I mean... I could probably write a fucking book on my life and it would actually be interesting because of all the fucking shit that I've been through. But I was still managed to uh, get a degree in film and a master's degree in business and be somewhat successful. I mean, I'm not rich or anything far from it, especially True, with but, inflation. But but, but, it, but you'll have to admit, the only reason you're not as successful a level as you might like is because of choices. 
Not because yeah, of exactly. not because it's of not, something holding no. you back. It's because of choices. It, this is the whole point of why I people I take re- right. I take responsibility, even though I mean, there's things that have happened that have contributed, uh, you know, in certain jobs and and shit that was out of my control, whatever. But when it comes down to it, I don't blame anybody for my position in life except myself. Uh You know, now other things, that doesn't mean that other things didn't affect that. But when it comes down to it, you have to take the responsibility to do what you need to do. Now, there are some exceptions like, you know, but you even have Stephen Hawking who, you know, I would say if you're born totally like Helen Keller, but look what what she did. But I, I don't blame people that are born like that that don't do anything. You know what I mean? Like, so I would give them a pass. But in general, if you don't make it, you know, you see even people like that that somehow fucking uh, become successful. I mean, it's unbelievable. Now, right. they had to work 50 to 100 or to 1,000 times harder, but they did it. Exactly. And you know, the thing about it is, is uh, back in the, back in this time when we were pioneering the west okay most of those families who went uh went west and left the cities of uh of the east you know went west of mississippi river they had a conestoga wagon with all their goods and they didn't have much they had the promise of land and they had to start from scratch so when somebody says well i ain't got nothing and i was brought up in the hood is that you know libraries are free and there are so many different government agencies that give you opportunity if you're willing to do there it. There are so many now. Um, it's it's ridiculous. You know, it, it if you go back, you know, maybe 50, 60 years, it didn't have. And I think a lot of them are obviously detrimental and shouldn't exist. But you have all those, too, on top of it. So it, I, I don't know. I think if people are as successful as they want to be uh to an extent you know um i don't expect everybody to be a millionaire and i I don't know that any everybody can be but you know it's also about making sacrifices why do you think you have people that come here from like india with no money and then they end up owning like 10 7-elevens in in you know 15 years and you see them working in those stores all day every day it's not like it's not like they somehow connived loans from the thing and then they just right. you know were successful no they did that that's that's well this is the point. Th- this is not just a, a, a racial thing Th- this is kids right now that are growing up they don't want to put in any work they expect everything to be handed to them right that you uh, know t- it, take a look at take a look at the you know i i, I took a a class on uh, African American history, 1954 to the present, starting at uh, Brown versus Board of Education. Yeah, I was going to say that's when that was. Uh... And the, the guy who was teaching it, he he was a black man. He was the assistant superintendent of all the schools in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. And he didn't have a racist bone in his body, even though he grew up in the South. He was one of the first athletes to uh, to to get to like I think the University of Illinois. This is just when they were integrating. Um, you know, oh no, he was from Corpus Christi, Texas, and he had uh, he had gone gotten a scholarship to the University of Illinois when they were just integrating blacks into the athletic programs, and he got a teaching degree because he because at that time, ninety eight percent of all blacks who had college degrees had teaching degrees because the most important thing was education will get you out of your rut, and uh, we saw you know. The Tuskegee Airmen, they went to college, but yeah, uh, they made you know, a movie they, on them. Yeah, exactly. There were many it, different but... instances of, of about this. But the problem is today is that um, the the communities, a lot of these communities don't have visions. And they've been living for two generations now of, of freebies. And I hate to say it, whether you're black, white, brown, Asian, or whatever, if somebody's going to give you free stuff – Man is a lazy animal. Well, and then they would they Man start the voting animal. cycle too, where then they're they're going to vote. You know, 
for and I again I don't think it matters because I think it's all controlled but that's what I believe the powers that be want want they want a totally government controlled uh country and that's going to what it it's going to lead to because they're going to politically believe in that they're well, not sure. going to stand up they're not going to be people that believe in in real freedom because they're going to be people that believe the government should do this and the government should do that. Um, I, I know we got totally off uh, topic, not that that was a bad thing because that was a good uh, discussion, but I want to kind of just finish up on uh, Russia real quick and then we'll uh, take a, a brief uh, break and then uh, talk about a bunch of other stuff that's going on. So just briefly, um, Talk about I, I, what's going on with uh, you. You did mention the uh, the hacking and whatnot, and, and yeah, and that, that's just that's just a basic thing. Let, but let me, uh, the propaganda and how there how there seems to be a, an attack uh, in the media, which I call government media, to get people uh, anti Russia to 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 push an anti Russian sentiment. Right, and, and it's and it's not just the liberals, but you got to remember this: the the recent WikiLeaks dumps, okay, were of John Podesta, who was the uh, he's the campaign manager for Hillary Clinton, and and, uh, and, and he's been uh, he's done a lot of other things. Like I said, he was the representative on that uh, from the United States uh, for that United Nations uh, document as well. So he's he's worked in other areas uh, also throughout his right career yeah and the, and the point is is that john podesta you know he's a long term but he's also a neocon and when i say neocon everybody latches on to conservative and they think republican no neocon is uh is a type of political doctrine similar to like communism marxism maoism you know maoism is a different type of communism neoconservative is a different type of political thing yeah maoism is uh i'm gonna kill you <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Now, here, here's the thing about uh, neoconservatism. After the fall of the Cold War, uh, there was a a, do, um, a guy named Paul Wolfowitz wrote a doctrine that said, we are the true only superpower the, in the world. The Wolfowitz doctrine. It was actually right. called that, right? Exactly. Yeah, I remember and hearing about it. The whole thing it. behind it is, is that the United States will use its foreign policy to ensure that no other superpower ever rises that can be in opposition to the imperialism that the United States wants to use to dominate the world. Okay, uh, we became an empire. We we were we were a superpower, but when the Soviet Union fell, we became an empire, an imperial empire. Well, what happened over time, of course, is that uh, they, they were doing shit before that to become an empire. I mean, before well, the Soviet yeah, but, Union fell. I mean, look at what they were doing with uh, installing rulers in the Middle East, like I, I ran and, you know, um, other places in the, you know, between World War, say between World War Two or after World War Two, between there and the time that, you know, uh, the Soviet I mean, Union using- fell. I'm using the historical uh, inference of an empire. Right, an right. empire means that you have no opposition. But they were setting. So, uh, it, they they were. Uh, I'm just saying that they were doing a lot of things prior to kind of like set them up to well, sure. have an empire well, sure. in the future. I mean, I mean, think of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was in charge of Mas- You know, he took over for his father in charge of Macedonia, uh, but he wanted to take over all of Greece. Greece was not an empire. Persia was the empire. There was there was no opposition to it. Um, so they, he ended up uh, taking over all, conquering all of Greece, and then he moved over to Persia. Had a big war, and once he once he killed the king uh, Xerxes or Darius, it was either Darius or Xerxes. He took over as as king of the of the empire, and now it was called. Uh, the Macedonian Empire got swapped over. Persian Empire was now dead. Um, he brought over uh, every single place that he conquered. He brought in um, Greek architecture, Greek language, Greek theater, Greek culture. It was known as Hellenism. 
Okay. And he created, he moved all this in, in the course of like 12 years, all the way to the, to the edge of India before he was killed or before he died. Okay. The Macedonian empire didn't last very long, but it was an empire because it, it overtook the other empire Right here. Right. The U the U S uh, you know, when the, there were, there's always going to be other countries that can stand up, but they can't, they, they aren't a threat. Okay. And uh, so why, why did uh, we go into Iraq? We went to Iraq because Saddam Hussein was a threat because he was going to start selling oil in a different currency, which was going to affect the empire's ability to, to use the petrodollar. Same thing with Libya. He was going to create a gold-backed currency in Africa where the empire, the U.S. empire, wanted to control African resources, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the problem is, is that in our laxity, Russia and China became superpowers again and they became a threat and with nato and you know u.s having domination over europe and nato they didn't have to worry about about the control there just to mention real quick uh russia was a mess for a while after it, it it, the soviet union fell it was like it was a mess literally um you want, you want to know about the right you know what the, you know, the real reason for the rise of putin is uh, Putin, yes, he was he was part of the KGB, but he was also an advisor to uh, Boris Yeltsin, and Boris Yeltsin was a puppet tool. He came after Gorbachev. He was a puppet tool of uh, the U.S. and the Rockefellers. And when the Soviet Union fell, what uh, what Yeltsin did was allowed the big oil companies and big corporations from the U S and Rockefeller to come in and start doling out all of Russia's resources. And you know, the oligarchs that came, that sprung out of during the, during those times before Putin, these oligarchs were a bunch of criminals that the U S paid CIA used to prop up whatever they controlled the corporations, but really they were just figureheads for the U S to steal all these resources well, he also well, ended up with a bunch of real criminals. Like there wasn't a huge Russian, a powerful Russian mafia before the Soviet Union fell. But uh, that's a whole nother issue. Yeah, but the but these mafias came out of the fall of the Soviet Union. Right, you know, right. Yeah, I know. Nature abhors uh, exactly. a vacuum, and the vacuum was for. And, for and they got a hold of like I, I remember. Shit, I forget what I was watching, but you know. As uh, it fell apart, I mean, things like nuclear weapons uh, got out. Like all right. of these, <laughs> you had but the you, Russian mafia got their hands on like uh, all these weaponry and all of this shit that just came out of the Soviet Union d collapsing. Right. The Federation, all the Baltic states that were part of the Soviet Union, held caches of of nuclear weapons. Those are the ones that uh, you know when Russia's government fell. They couldn't control all that, so the the which, which shows came in and got hold of it. which shows obviously how how much it, the, there's you know this whole threat of terrorism is is so bullshit because you know they could these things are around and if somebody really wanted to you know do the type of damage that they keep talking about that they've been talking about for years 20 to 30 years maybe since even Oklahoma City um they could do it, it it's it's such hype and and propaganda and bullshit and most of the uh events the hardly any uh really there's really only two real terrorist events because the other ones were more u.s citizens that happen to be muslim but whatever boston bombing to me was definitely cia or fbi or whatever but um i, I think were done by the government anyway so well, it's Sandy just Hook a whole too. bunch of you know, bullshit you know, they, somebody somebody just uh did, well i think uh, the story is not the story whatever the, the, this thing that this little tiny fucking skinny kid and, you know, I've fired, um, you know, AR-15s and AK-47s, and it's just like the Orlando shooting. Um, there is no way that that was carried out by that one person. No, as a matter of fact, they, what they discovered about the Orlando shooting that they, that they really aren't talking about in the media is the fact that nobody was killed until... I think the SWAT police. Entered, yeah, exactly. SWAT entered the building. I think they killed the majority of people. Uh, because there is no way you would have to have your one. 
you uh, would have to have so many rounds on you, it's not even funny. And you're, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Your hit-to-miss ratio would have to be so good that it's it's impossible. It's just, I read about that, and I did a show on it, and I'm like, no, this is, it's impossible that uh, one person did that. It's just, it's bullshit. And the same uh, with Sandy Hook. It's the same, uh, similar circumstances, but sorry, I don't want to get, you know, Yeah, I, I, I uh, don't to, want to uh, train out in Russia. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, Putin, Putin uh, you know, slowly moves in power, and what he did was, see, Putin is not a communist. Putin is a nationalist. He loves his country. He wants his country to be strong again. He saw his country fall apart after the fall of the Soviet Union, and he saw all these foreigners coming in and pretty much, you know, raping it like uh, like pirates in a, like a, in a raid. Like a sail, <laughs> like a fucking... And so, yeah. so Putin was able to use his, uh, you know, his political acumen to solidify the government, and then he went after the oligarchs. And he didn't kill and jail all the oligarchs. What he did was he said, "Look, you're running the companies. You know, you're making billions of dollars. That's fine. What you need to do, though, is you need to divest your agreements with, uh, you know, Exxon Mobil and BP and all that, and you're going to do what." the government policy wants you to do in regards to oil production and this and that. Well, about half the oligarchs said, you know, that's absolutely fine. I'm rich. I don't care. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and do this, but half of them did not. And those are the ones that were, were jailed. Okay. And had, had their, their money taken from them, et cetera. Well, here's the thing. Russia has slowly built up. They, they created, you know, during the Soviet union days, Maoism and, and, Soviet communism, where they despise each other, they hate each other. But neither one is truly communist at all. As a matter of fact, uh, China is politically communist, i.e. they're a socialistic oligarchy, but their economic is capitalism. And both Russia today and China are, are the capitalism that the United States used to be. Today in the United States, we don't have capitalism. We have creditism. The difference is, is that uh, thing you know, growth comes from capital, from savings, from investing, and this and that. Today, in the United States and in Europe and in Japan, it comes from the creation of money out of thin air. Well, it's also Credit. corporatism and government well, yeah, but, picking the but, winners but and losers. Been around, and... But I'm talking about the the general economy in the United States. Think about it. They can't raise interest rates. They can't stop uh, quantitative easing and stimulus. If they do. Then Everything the whole fall economy apart, falls right. apart because they need. Once you create a debt a debt spiral, okay, you need to keep putting in more and more and more new money. Otherwise, you have what the Fed keeps talking about: we're af deathly afraid of deflation. Deflation is the equivalent of the, the the bubbles bursting, prices just falling through the floor because nothing can prop them up anymore. The Russia has no external debt, has very little debt, and they've got something like twenty to thirty thousand tons of gold. China has a, a lot of debt. They have they have probably more in dollar wise than the United States does, but none of it's held by foreigners. It's all internal, which means that they could wipe it away with the you know uh, the stroke of a pen. The United States cannot do that. Of our twenty trillion dollars in national debt, fourteen trillion of it is owned by foreigners. And you can't just wipe it away. It's a it's an international contract. So um, Russia, of course, wants to create these uh, these trade unions. They're not interested in military com uh, conquest, and neither is China. They want to they want to uh, get their power through economic through control of the economic mechanisms. Well, the United States, of course. The only way the empire continues is with control over the reserve currency, the dollar. The Chinese yuan is a threat to the dollar. Russia's control over the oil uh, and energy in the world, they're the largest producer and largest distributor now, their control threatens the U U.S. empire. Well, and they also make them out to be like they want to take over the world. Remember what happened in Crimea. They still bring up in the debate they did this. Right. I believe that they brought up or they they do it when they're talking, um, the, the presidential candidates, that Russia 
you know, uh, took over Crimea, invaded it, and the whole Ukraine thing that, you know, it didn't have anything to do with the U.S. uh, going in and, you know, or CIA or whoever fucking was behind it, you know, and all that shit. They they totally, I I don't, it's, it's like shocking how they can look at history. And I think this was actually in the last debate. um, And they totally changed what the reality was. That's because it's it's fucking, it's, it's nuts. And people don't say anything. Hillary Clinton knows exactly what happened and what's going on because she was secretary of state. Of course. And her assistant, her assistant secretary of state, Victoria Newland put, you know, went she went and did a press conference with, with a Chevron symbol promoting it right behind her saying we just put five billion dollars into the Ukraine over the last few years and within a month the the uh, the uh, Kiev maiden coup took place okay right now um, the the puppet that is in there is a Nazi Yatsen Suk is a Nazi he was part of the Nazi party he was a nobody in a third party and they propped him up now here's something else that people don't know the new uh, finance minister, for Ukraine, she moved in there about six months ago, was a former member of the U.S. Secretary, or State Department who was a Ukrainian U.S. citizen. So she speaks the language. So we have a State Department person from the U.S. now, the finance minister of Ukraine. And then, of course, Joe Biden's son goes over and gets appointed to the board of the largest energy company in Ukraine. Bo You're going to tell me that isn't Russia his name Bo? In, yeah. <laughs> Why no would you name Bo? But it, doesn't he have a son named Bo? Well, he did. Why would you name your son Bo Biden? That just <laughs> But well, anyway. Really a nickname. It, is is that the uh, son that died? I think that was the son that died, yeah. The other the other one's uh, in charge there. But okay. here's the point. Okay? All the all these US Puppets were put into place in Ukraine. So how did Russia right. attack and do this? Right, right. No, but they the say thing about Crimea. I know, but here's the problem. Uh, Hillary knows about it, and there's not a single thing that she can't say that isn't a lie. She, she's a liar. But she's it's a- not just her. It's They bring it up in the debates. They have the moderators bring it up and ask about well, it. Well, well what about second. when Russia did this? Wait, and Yeah, but wait a second. Who are the moderators? Right, right. I, I, I know. The, I, I, I totally understand the- that. But nobody says shit. They just believe because it Trump, like idiots. Because Trump doesn't have i mean trump is not a politician i'm not even talking about trump i'm talking about the people uh the people people of the the, that live in the united states um watch the mainstream media and that's right well i call it government media but yeah Yeah. and it's it was the same thing with uh syria and they keep saying that Syria, Syria is the one that used gas, not the rebels. And that's already been proven that the rebels did. But now in debates, they brought that up, too. And well, these, these, the were the, Look, these were the debates of the, the, uh, the main, you know, Republican media. or Democrats, you but, know. But, you but yeah, it. it's all government media. I know. You don't get it. Okay. No, no I do. I understand why. Okay. I'm just but you're making a point. Accepting it. No, no, no. I'm just I'm being over dramatic because I'm doing a okay. show. But I, say, I, the American people are ignorant. Okay? Because think right, about it. I know. I, if, I mean if they don't if they don't have the fortitude to get themselves out of their bootstraps and their and their poor poverty mentality, how the hell do we expect them ever to do any type of looking into the actuality right. of foreign affairs? Okay. Here's now. Now here's the thing. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll fast forward to the recent. Time. Yeah, I was going to say just uh, sum up basically Russia and why they, the United States and the government media, is now uh, trying to basically campaign for people to go back into the Cold War. Essentially, I mean, right. the 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 you you hit the nail on the head. At a certain point, the neocons decided that we need to create a proxy war, a.k.a. a new Cold War, as a means to stop uh, Russia's ability to use economic means to take over a lot of the old spots. Um, they did this. They stopped uh, You know, they used 9-11 as a lie to go into Afghanistan. 
That was to uh, to get the poppy and the heroin get back going again. They made a lie about Iraq, about weapons of mass destruction. That was a lie so they could get out Saddam Hussein, take over the central bank. Uh, the same thing about Libya. They did that to to get rid of because uh, yeah, Gaddafi, well, Gaddafi was, was right. Then they went into Syria. And now they're okay. trying to stop uh, Assad because of the same but reasons, it, but basically. But there's a whole bigger thing involved here, okay? The the Libyan rebels who took out um, Gaddafi, okay, these were a bunch of ragtag Muslims from several different places. They didn't have a nationality. They were what is called NGOs, non-governmental organizations. In essence, they were funded and trained by the intelligence services. And when I say intelligence services, I'm I'm mixing in either one or more MI6, MI6 CIA, right. Mossad, okay, all of them. They trained and funded these things. Now, after they killed Gaddafi and 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 pretty much eradicated Libya, then they were they they the intelligence services said we're going to move you into Syria because that's the next target. That's what Benghazi was all about. All the arms that they had used to moving the out, weapons, uh, yeah, had, had take out Libya. We're going to be we're going to be transferred and funded and moved towards Syria so that the fighters this. Uh, mysterious free Syrian army, which is just the same same uh, Muslims like Al Nusra and Al Qaeda who were fighting in Libya, they're now going to be fighting in Syria. Benghazi was an arms deal that yeah. went bad. Um, Chris Stevens, the ambassador to uh, to Benghazi, was also a CIA agent, and the problem is is that he was calling out this arms shipment to terrorists and that's why hillary clinton and barack obama did not send in the military right i've send heard, in, heard to that save him as well because that... he was going to be a whistleblower yeah now now this, uh, I'm, I'm fast forwarding this the arms got sent to uh to syria to the free syrian army um then they were going to try to take out assad well guess what after about a year of this war and the the with the help of the u.s they had moved in and taken large portions of uh, syria Assad, um, or Russia decided to come in as a, as a moderator, a mediator. And this was the September of 2014. And they said... That, that uh, was what, when uh, Obama was saying that they were going to have airstrikes or whatever. Is that what you're talking about? The chemical... What, what, uh, the chemical it was the when chemical they blame weapons. the chemical gas on, on Syria, on Assad. Right. That thing had gone through. And so uh, Russia went public and said, what would it take for you to to uh, not have to kill Assad. And, of course, um, Obama and, uh, and, uh, came out and flippantly said, the red line is, is they've got to get rid of their chemical weapons. And you know what Assad said? Fine, come in and get them. And they brought a UN thing and they took them, and they're gone. Now, all of a sudden, because the U.S. wanted to overthrow Assad, they were left in a, in a bind, okay? Because Assad had done what they wanted, right. and now they didn't have a justification to go right. in there. Even though they're so, still saying that they want to kill him. But. Right. So anyway, they start making propaganda that Assad tortures everybody and kills everybody, whatever. And it was at that point that Assad contacted Putin and say, we want your help. Because Russia already had a uh, naval base in on Tartarus. And so Russia was already partially that, involved in Syria. Just so I know and everybody knows it, that, I'm assuming that's like a city in Syria or something. It's a port. It's a port. Uh, but port it's, it's part of Syria. Right. It's okay. part of Syria. It's a port in so, Syria. So Russia okay. comes in and says, by all means, you know, we have a good p partnership. We're going to make a military alliance. Now, all of a sudden, the United States is going, hmm. Okay. So the Russia Russia just had this military alliance going. They're, they really didn't intervene too much. But all of a sudden, in 2015, early 2015, those free Syrian army uh, who suddenly didn't really want to go for it because now the U.S. wasn't backing them as much thanks to Russia coming in, they sort of splintered off. And this intelligence services got a former member of uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, uh, Royal Guard, the, or the Red Guard, and propped him up, al-Baghdadi, and they created this thing called the Islamic Caliphate. Okay? The Islamic Caliphate was a creation of the intelligence services. It was the next step. And they didn't focus on Syria at first. 
they went into Iraq, which the United States had pulled out. They went into um, parts of uh, where else? Parts of Afghanistan. And so then they started moving into Syria to make this caliphate. Well, the U.S. then, all of a sudden, Obama is being asked about about ISIS, a terrorist group, and he says, oh, they're just JV. We're not too worried about them. And for a year, the United States said, oh, yeah, we're attacking ISIS. No, they were dropping weapons and, and arming ISIS just as well as they were arming free, free Syrian army. Well, Putin had finally had enough and said, enough of this. We're going to, because we've been invited by Assad, it's not like they – they usurped and just attacked, you know, to move into conquer. They were invited by Assad and they started building up military and they started doing fly zones. And sure enough, within two weeks, they had pretty much blasted the free Syrian, you know, the, the NGOs of the CIA and ISIS. They had blasted them out of most of Syria in two weeks. It, what, what the United States didn't do in a year, Russia did in two weeks. Well, of course, now the U.S. is scrambling because all of a sudden the neocons are saying, oh, shit. We're, uh, so then what they did is they uh, they got a hold of Turkey, and they said, uh, hey, um, you're, you're a NATO ally. We have our base in Ankara here. We need you to start uh, – go back to war with the Kurds who are living in Syria and, and you know, widen, widen the, uh, the war. And if Russia attacks you, then you can claim defense, and all of NATO is going to come in. Now NATO's in. That was, that was the plan. Well, Turkey was sort of like, okay, we'll do this, heem ha. Well, here's the problem. Turkey had been the one ones buying the black market oil that ISIS had been stealing from from Iraq and and, and Syria. So Turkey now uh, was in in violation of sanctions. They were aiding and abetting terrorists. So they really didn't go too far in, you know, like and and what ended up happening was then is that some some general in Turkey uh, did the wrong thing. He shot down a Russian aircraft, and it was not in Turkish airspace. It was along the border in Syrian airspace. And then Russia just was about to, you know, go right into Turkey, and Turkey screams to NATO, we're under attack! But NATO was sitting there going, uh, you shot down a Turkish, I mean, a Russian aircraft, in not over your airspace, we don't want to have anything to do with you. Now Turkey's pissed because they don't feel they have the support of NATO. And so Russia patiently, you know, Putin didn't, didn't go in and attack Turkey. What he just said is fine. You know what? You rely on most of our people coming to Turkey and the Turkish beaches for tourism. We're, I'm, you know, we're putting sanctions. Nobody's going for your tourism. We're putting sanctions on buying your food. We're putting sanctions on this. And within nine months, Tur Turkey's economy collapsed, okay, because they relied too much on Russian money. Well, Erdogan then was uh, starting to feel the heat from the people in the economy. And uh, the intelligence services, i.e. the CIA, MI6, Mossad, who, whichever one of them, decided that they were going to uh, extort or bribe a few officers in the in the um, Turkish military, and they were going to try a coup. And that was the coup that ch – but they didn't have enough of them. The coup failed pretty quick, and it gave – that suddenly gave Erdogan the power to bring about a form of martial law and authoritarianism. Um, but what that did too is Erdogan suddenly realized that they were no longer allies. You know, the U.S. was not going to stand with them. NATO wasn't going to stand with them. You know what? Why don't we reach over the aisle, make an apology to Russia, and then make an alliance with, with uh, Russia? And that's what they did. And Russia, with their patience, said, you know what? We'll welcome you back. Um, we're going to put in this Turk Stream pipeline. That was another reason why the U.S. was going after Syria is because uh, – Russia was going to create the uh, Nord Stream pipeline that was going to bypass Ukraine. Right, which we had talked about in, in right. the past. And so that was going, and all of a sudden Turkey is now great friends, and they just signed a, a new alliance, you know, trade agreement. Boom, boom. Well, here's what happened. Um, Russia, again, using patience, came out publicly and said, look, U.S., we want to work with you to get rid of ISIS. 
We both want to fight terrorism. Syria wants to fight terrorism. Turkey wants to fight terrorism. We're all scared of whatever. Well, the U.S. funded and created them. So if all of a sudden they were taking them out, they'd be defeating their own purpose. So what ended up happening was recently, about three weeks ago. The, uh, you're going to mention the attack that the U.S. Uh, accidentally, which is bullshit, uh, bombed uh, the Syrian army, essentially. The Syrian army was at, a, was at a forward outpost looking over, you know, a number of miles from Aleppo. On a hill overlooking them was some of ISIS fighters. Out of nowhere, the United States takes a couple of A-10s and attacks this Syrian army outpost, uh, kills 82, and allows ISIS then to move forward in, into the thing. And then says it was an accident. And, which, well, which first is- they lied. First, they lied and, and said they say it what they didn't down. do it. Yeah, and, and then, then they, once it was overwhelming proof, right? They said, they said it was an accident, mistake. just like they said. Um, and I just want to say this real quickly: it was it was an accident. Well, the other thing they said was an accident is that they let in all these people that are connected to ISIS, and they didn't know, but now they know. Oops, into yeah. the country. Now here's the here's the meaning other thing. into the U.S. So sorry, go ahead. Okay, so anyway, Syria's pissed. Russia's pissed. Uh, Russia knows that they can't trust John Kerry, uh, Obama. They're, they're just run by neocons who are psychopaths. They don't care if they set the world on fire. So here's here's the, the rumor that I've heard. Over at roguemoney.net, we've got a lot of uh, uh, writers who are have tremendous sources. One of them is a writer for one of the main publications here in the United States, but he's married to a Russian woman, and he has contacts going all the way up to the Kremlin, over in uh, in Russia, so he gets he knows what's what's going on in the ground. Uh, he wrote a, he wrote a story that uh, about an event that recently occurred, where Russia found a bunker that was holding about fifty um, Western intelligence agents, i.e., CIA, Mossad, MI6, whoever, whoever was in there. But they weren't supposed to be there. Legally, they weren't supposed to be there. There's no boots on the ground. There's not supposed to be these NGOs. And Russia bombed the hell out of them and killed them. At that point, nobody knows why, but all of a sudden, John Kerry says, we're cutting diplomatic relations with Russia over Syria. We're done with you. That was the, that was the incident that caused this to happen. Well, now all of a sudden, there's some generals at the Pentagon who are starting the war chants about war with Russia. Now, here's, here's where Hillary Clinton at the debates came in. She says, we need to have a no-fly zone over, over Syria. Well, you know what? Uh, to do so is an act of war, and it requires Congress to do right. so. Right, well, because that would mean that they would shoot down uh, anybody that flew over Syria. I mean, I, right. I, I guess they would try to, uh, you know, what's your purpose first or whatever, but they might just, you know, fire. Hey, you're over. You, you're flying over Syria. Um, we're shooting you down, which, right. mean, which would cut off— uh, just real quick, which would cut off all uh, things that the country obviously needs to fly in and fly out of well, Syria. That, that, that wouldn't last very long because the moment that uh, U.S. aircraft go beyond the scope of where they're supposed to be right now, the Russians will, will shoot them down in a New York minute. Okay? They're not supposed to be there. They're only supposed to be in coordination to take out ISIS. They're not supposed to go after any other thing. They don't have the right of that. I mean, this is not like Iraq. When they we have they no shouldn't be there, Iraq. period. I mean, well, they, exactly. crea- they created ISIS in the first place anyway, and Russia can take care of them uh, with Syria. Um, but they shouldn't, obviously, they shouldn't have created ISIS, but they shouldn't be, they shouldn't have got involved in the beginning. It was a civil well, of war. Course they shouldn't. It was they, a civil war no, in Syria. War. No, it wasn't a civil war. It was well. It was not a civil war, like but it was Maiden, rebels it was like, attacking. They they were the NGOs. government. They were Al Qaeda who were there on orders. Of oh, I see what you're saying. So like, they weren't even like they rebel. Weren't they weren't even they're rebels. Even okay. Yeah. This is the equivalent of the Kiev crew coup. Because okay. I thought at least at the beginning that there were actually well, legitimate Syrian rebels that you were may have some Syrians, but they're, worse they're, than... They're the equivalent of, think of a Syrian who's Al-Qaeda. Okay. Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying, that, that, the, that the rebels were, were all, you know, uh, terrorists that, that were trying to take it. over the country. 
And um, the terrorists don't have any allegiance. They're just a mishmash of right, um, right. jihadists from all over the region. So they're sure, I'm sure there are some Syrians, but it's not that it's a Syrian-based army. Right, right. Okay. But it's something they they shouldn't be involved in. And then the, to justify it in the beginning, they say, well, Assad's this big murderer. He's killing all these rebels. And John McCain goes over there and hangs out with terrorists and says, oh, yeah, we should arm these people. Yeah, exactly. And they did arm them. I mean, he, he, that, I think, was uh, even admitted by, it, it, right, as far as I know. I mean, they won't admit that they created ISIS or that they run ISIS, but they have uh, admitted to funding and training, quote unquote, rebels, which that's not what they are, Well, as we just this established. Gets, this, gets, this gets back to some of the WikiLeaks. The WikiLeaks and the John Podesta files show that Hillary Clinton took money from uh, Qatar to send them military arms, and those arms uh, did go to ISIS and Al-Qaeda. So Hillary Clinton took money to arm and fund terrorists. And then, then they sent okay. some legs, too. Yeah, and this is the reason why Podesta and all of them are blaming Russia, okay? Because the playbook of the liberal is this. Never refute the allegations, always slander the accuser. They are using this. Russia did it. Russia is trying to affect the election. Trump is in with Russia. They're trying to do this so people don't question them on what's in their WikiLeaks. Well, it's not. It's not just. Yeah, it's not just that. That's it's it, it's it, also the, the not just them, but I mean, it's the government media in, ge- in general because of all the other stuff that you mentioned. They want people to blame Russia for right. all of this stuff and blame Syria. So justification to either go to war with Russia or go to war with Syria or get involved in whatever they want the American public to uh, be convinced that this all this shit is legitimate. There, there are five pillars that a country needs to be able to have a successful war. One of them is public relations. The public has to be involved in it. And that's this what they're is, trying to do right this now. This is why Vietnam failed. Okay is because at a certain point the public started rebelling well, against the e- even even the fucking you know people that they were defending started rebelling right, right. <laughs> but here here's the point too okay we've been at war well for- vietnam was another war that they shouldn't have got involved in because it was of a civil course. war of it's, course, it's korea right. was a civil war basically um, i mean well here's the thing um places like korea and vietnam and china even uh they they had lost their leadership when Japan took them over and when World War II ended, all of a sudden there was a vacuum. And that's why the Civil War happened in those areas. There was a vacuum. Well, because Russia did not uh, move out of Germany and wanted and built the, the wall and built all this stuff, right, the Cold War sprung from that. And uh, the, the neocons at the time, the military industrial complex said, we got to keep wars going. So let's yep. start a doctrine uh, the Truman Doctrine, which they said, we will fight communism, for, right, for democracy, and yep, yep, that's where the whole whole thing. Anyway, getting back to Russia, which led to um, things like Cuba and all of that, and yeah. it just in the in the Cold War was another reason to, you know, uh, keep them armed and keep that uh, whole you know psychological war going and it just it, ridiculousness, but. But yeah, so I think you pretty much on that. No, there's a few. There's a few okay, things that are, are important. Okay, I tried. To, I tried to lay this out because here's the thing: diplomatic relations were broken off for the first time since the Cold War, at least for a week. Now all of a sudden they're talking a little bit again. But here's the thing: um, Russia is in extreme belief that the U.S. may be involved in wanting to start a nuclear war. A week and a half ago, they did a drill where they had 12 million of their other citizens go into underground uh, nuclear protected bunkers as a test drill. They also started moving new nuclear ICBMs into the border states and along along the frontier. And you're talking about okay. Russia. Russia. R- Putin has already come out and said on TV that the United States is trying to create World War Three. So and, the rhetoric it, has gone to the point that nuclear war is a is closer now, or as close as when we had the like uh, in the sixties, the Cuban, Cuban missile, missile right? And of course, uh, the government media in the U.S. is going to say 
you know, oh, he's trying to start this. And, you know, and that's why another reason they're spreading all their propaganda and all the bullshit and, right. you know, and so all of that. So the, the, the spin doctors in the media, right. and of course, the Clintons and Podesta and all that are trying to use this as a means to ensure that they get into office. Because I tell you what, I will say this, if, you know, to the best of my knowledge at this point, you know, things can change. Kennedy tried to um, uh, end the Cold War, but when he did, the neocons who were in there, the Dulles brothers, um, all of those, they went behind his back and they, they made sure that none of the things that he tried to do, you know, as a matter of fact, there's a, there's a, a memoir that uh, Khrushchev said, Kennedy, he and Kennedy would talk on the red phone a lot just before leading up to uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and they were trying to, um, you know, bring bring the Cold War to an end in some t- t- type of fashion. Well, because it, it it was it was over, from what I understand, just communism, it, the doctrine that you just mentioned. That it, besides that, what reason did the United States have? to have anything against Cuba. You got you got you know here's here's the reason for Cuba, okay? Uh the United States during in the Cold War, they had just put in and let's get back to the ally, they had just put nuclear weapons in Ankara, Turkey, right on the border of Russia. Right. And then, and then Russia put weapons in Cuba. And then Russia Cuba. was going to start putting them on Cuba right. to be in the same thing. That's what the whole thing. Now, what came out of the Cuban Missile Crisis is is that Russia did pull out. Um, the, the, you know, they didn't put it, install any nukes in in Cuba. But what usually isn't written in the history books is that in in ex- agreement for this, the United States pulled out the nukes that were in Turkey. But so the, that's the, all they wanted. Well, the other get your nukes off right, our board. Right. But but the other thing was that even after that, you know, you had uh, CIA and whatnot, and supposedly this is one of the reasons. I mean, this is in the movie JFK that they killed uh, Kennedy. Um, you right, know, they were mad Kennedy- at him about Cuba because they still wanted to go after Cuba even after the missile crisis was over exactly. because they're a communist country. Co- and it was it was driven by well, they're communist and Castro run. I mean, that's where interfering in other countries' businesses well, the other, the other, is you, you know. See, commun- communism is a communism is a is a fallacy. No, yeah, no, they never went to war over. No, 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 no. There has never been a truly communist country in the history of the planet. Communism is a label for a socialistic oligarchy, and well, what that yeah, means is but... is that a small group of people own all the means of production. That's well, it. Most people associate like with the word socialism and communism, but right, but it's a socialistic oligarchy. But and yeah, what ended up happening was, you know, why Fidel Castro. Um, did the revolution and took over Cuba. It's because the United States took out Batista. It's because if we had not messed around with Cuba in the first place, Fidel yeah, they Castro, installed him in the, in Fidel the uh, Castro, first place. Fidel Castro wanted to be a pro baseball player. And I think he was like in double A AA or triple A of the Yankees. And then uh, the U.S. started meddling in and putting their puppet in Cuba and that's when Castro said, screw this, we're going to do the revolution, and boom. Right, if you've seen the movie Godfather Part 2, uh, they actually have a scene where um, he resigns, Batista, and uh, you know Castro is, is taking over. It, it happened on New Year's Eve. I don't know if it, in actuality it happened on New Year's Eve or not when he resigned, but um, it's just an interesting piece of history how they try to integrate actual history with what happened with the Godfather. Although the Godfather was based on a lot of actual characters, um, I don't know if you've seen the Godfather movies, but oh yeah, but yeah, yeah like funny. Hyman Roth was based on um, what's his name, Maya Lansky, and you know stuff like that. So they were right. based on actual, and he did go to Cuba a lot and had a lot of interest there. Oh yeah, you know. Think about the old I Love Lucy. You know, Cuba was a fantastic place. If you lived in Florida. Yeah, they loved night, it night, back then. You, you would fly over on a on a Friday evening after you got off work. You'd go to the clubs. You'd go to the little casinos. You could just eat there, you know, and you come back on a, on a Sunday morning after breakfast. 
you know, and, and, you know, rest in the rest of the day and go back to work. It was, it was a paradise. It was just a perfect little jaunt to go. The, uh, the problem though, is that, um, with, uh, Oh, I've lost my train of thought, but, um, yeah, Cuba was, you know, Cuba was supposed to be a, uh, Oh, uh, I remember what I was going to say. The, in the F, you know, the, the CIA after the CIA, um, Kennedy was going to um, have the military send over aircraft support for the Cuban refugee, you know, the Cuban nationals here to take out Fidel Castro. Okay, that was the Bay of Pigs. Alan right. Dulles, Alan Dulles went to the Pentagon and said, no, you're not going to send air support. He, he, no got, air support. Fu- he got fired over that, wasn't it? Yeah. Right. Exactly, but he he usurped the president. Yeah, uh, the president, you know, the the Bay of Pigs failed, and suddenly Kennedy was left in a quandary because if he said that his Secretary of State or whoever or National Security Advisor had gone over his head and stopped this, then the American people would think that Kennedy was not in control of the country as a president. Uh, so he was left with no alternative but to take responsibility for it. Then he fired Dulles. Um, and he was going to then break the CIA into a thousand pieces. Yeah, that's exactly what they said in JFK, the exact words that, you know, they go through. That's why that movie is such a great movie, because a lot of it is historically accurate. It seems right. like Oliver Stone tried to make that as historically accurate oh, as possible. Well, he does. And, and same, same thing with The Godfather, you know. Mario well, The Godfather, Puzo, it, it, it is, but yeah, it's based on Mario. Like you were going to say, sorry to Mar- interrupt. Mario but. Puzo had to, you know, had to make it fictional enough because if he came out and made it absolute, they would have uh, killed him. Exactly, because this was back. I mean, he wrote that. You know, the movies came out in the early seventies, so he wrote it even before that. So yeah, they would have killed him if he uh, <laughs> had the named thing, the names. If you remember Godfather Part Three. You remember, you remember the 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 really holy priest that uh, heard confession for Michael Corleone about you know yeah his that brother. he killed his brother yeah yeah and then he became the pope but he only lived for two weeks because he was going to do an audit of the Vatican Bank that was that they, a mirror of the pope that in the I think late seventies early eighties had died after being only in office two weeks supposedly he was poisoned because he was going to audit the Vatican Bank that's crazy. Yeah, because obviously uh, there's shady things going on there. Absolutely, the Vatican owns upwards of twenty to forty percent of all the real estate in Europe. Well, I mean, we know at least from one standpoint, from a different aspect, there's proof that there were shady things with what went on with all the rapes and the little boys and all that shit. So we already know that. So I mean, well, obviously, yeah, that's, even, that's even worse. There, there are there are. Uh, stories going back into the Vatican for, for hundreds, if not a thousand. No, I'm sure. That I mean, uh, there is a level of the Vatican has a sort of a dirt floor and it's just, it's, it's covers thousands of bones of children who were killed that were, um, con- you know, conceived and given birth by nuns in the Vatican for these quote unquote celibate, uh, celibate priests. Yeah, that's fucked up. I, I, I don't they, know how true this is, but just to mention this uh, briefly, that I was watching some um, or listening to, to some video about the New World Order and whatever, and I, I took it kind of, you know, I, I, with a grain of salt. But, you know, I listened to the stuff that they said, and a lot of it, uh, they had to do with the Vatican and controlling things and having to the connection between world government and, and the Vatican, not, I don't know if it's so much the Vatican than it was like the, uh, Catholic, uh, well, sure. I mean, and the Vatican's not only a recent thing, you know, Italy only became a country in about 1854, 1840s, um, Garibaldi and then, uh, Giuseppe Mazzini and Giuseppe Mazzini, um, who was part of the, uh, uh, you know, construction of the Italian country, the Italian state, Giuseppe Mazzini was the one who created the mafia. And, uh, the other Garibaldi was from the Southern part of Italy. Uh, Mazzini was from the North 
And the the Vatican, there ne never used to be a quote unquote Vatican. The uh, the Catholic Church was uh, owned the, what is called the Papal States. And the Papal States uh, used to range from different times. First, it was Rome, and then that you know it's kind of interesting. You remember the bankers, the uh, Venetian bankers of the 14th century, the ones who pretty much you know started the Renaissance because they started uh, giving money to all these uh, like. Um, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, they were the ones who supported it. But they were the bankers of that time. And there was two, uh, one banker family called Medicis. And the Medicis uh, were like the bankers of the of the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church, uh, the Pope, owed a ton of gold to the Medicis. Well, they didn't want to pay it back. So they got with a rival banker family and they said, uh, we, will, we will support you in uh, killing the Medicis. And on, like, a Sunday mass service right there in the church is when the Pope allowed them to kill. So you want to talk about sacrilege. The Pope orders the death of somebody because he owed him money, and then they do it on Sunday mass service. Well, that's why religion is obviously, you know, the Catholic, so, a bunch the of bullshit. Every religion. The Catholic Church was created by Constantine because Constantine knew that the Roman Empire was deteriorating. So they were going to lose the, the secular empire. But by creating a religion, you could carry on the Roman Empire through control of a religion. And this is why um, Charlemagne was, uh, was crowned the, um, uh, Rome, the new Roman emperor when he took over France. OK, in the dark ages. Well, how did the church? It was also a group that created Charlemagne. He's the king of France. So why is he given the title of Roman emperor? You know, see, that's the thing about it is, is because the Roman Empire never ended. It just shifted from secular to religious. And that's what they are, is they are a power structure. It's a political entity. It's not a religion. No, definitely. But I mean, just in general, um, you know, religions to me are all the bullshit because they were written by man. But uh, I got to take a break. I don't know if you can uh, stick around for a little while and uh, get to some other stories that uh, I wanted to talk about. Um, yeah, let's go quick right. another half hour I can do. We will be right back, and I guess we will be back with Ken. <laughs> so otherwise I was going to just talk about them um, based on your what you had mentioned in your show and your articles because I think there's some uh, that are pretty important that we, we need to uh, talk about real quick. So uh, we'll take a break and play some clips, and then we'll be back. Of course, again, check us out at Nonpartisan Liberty for All or give us a call at 702-470-7664. That's 702-470-7664. Nonpartisan Liberty for All dot com. Hey, an alien. Yes, I've traveled across space to check on the progress of your species. Cool. Shall I take you to our leader? Your what? Our leader, the guy in charge. The guy in charge of what? Well, in charge of everything. You have one guy in charge of everything? No, no, he's in charge of government. What is government? Well, government makes the rules for us. It tells us what we can do and what we can't do. So is government really smart? They come up with wise rules for you to follow? Well, mostly. But some of its rules are really stupid. Do you disregard those rules? No, we have to follow the rules, even if they are stupid or we disagree with them. Government punishes anyone who disobeys the rules. So you are slaves to government? No, 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 it's not like that at all. Government works for us, the people. It serves us. We're the boss. It tells you what to do, and it punishes you with violence if you disobey it, and yet you're its boss? Yeah. But there are some things government does that you don't like. 
Well, yeah, not everything government does is popular. Like spending on wars, for example. What is a war? It's when government basically spends the people's money on weapons and soldiers and then sends them over to the other side of the world to kill a bunch of people over there and destroy their country. I don't like it that government does this. Well, I can see why you might not like that. Have you humans reached the stage where you generally consider stealing, enslaving and killing each other to be bad things? Oh yeah, we know that. Don't steal, don't attack, don't assault. But you give money to government and they use it to kill people. Well, yeah. But government does good things with tax money as well. Why don't you stop paying for the things you don't like and only pay for the good things it does? No, we can't do that. You can't just decide to stop paying taxes because the rules say that everyone has to pay taxes. But the rules come from government though, don't they? Yeah. So government made a rule which says that everyone has to pay them money? So everyone pays taxes because if they didn't, government would punish them using violence? Well, yes, but most people don't mind paying taxes. Most people feel obligated to pay taxes and obey government laws because it's for the good of society. Society needs government and that means we all have to pay taxes. So just to make sure I've got this straight, Government makes the rules and you feel obligated to follow the rules, even the ones you don't like, and it tells you what to do and threatens to punish you if you don't do what it says, and it uses some of the money that it's taken from you using threats of violence to pay for things you don't like and actually think are immoral, like mass murder. Yeah, but we can ask it to please tell us to do smart things. And please don't take our money and use it to kill people. We're allowed to ask them to tell us to do what we want them to tell us to do. Are you guys just scared of this thing? Is government some huge monster that can just squish you at any moment if you disobey? No, government isn't a monster. Well, what is it then? Could you draw me a picture of it? Government isn't really the sort of thing you can draw a picture of. Maybe you could take me to it. Where is government? You mean the building? Government is a building. No, but the politicians who make up the government have buildings they work from. So government is a group of these politicians? Yeah. OK, so what species are these politicians? Well, they're human. Like you? Yeah. So politicians are humans and they're government. You're a human, but you're not government. No. So it's the politicians, they're the ones that boss the rest of you around and make you do things you don't want to do and take your money using threats of violence. But even though you're all humans, you're not allowed to boss them around and take their money? No, they'd put us in a cage if we did that. But look, it's not like the politicians can just do whatever they want. Like, a politician can't just come up to me on the street and make me give him money. They can't do that. Politicians can only do things like that in their job, when they're working for government. Oh, so politicians aren't government. They just work for government. Yeah. OK, so government isn't a monster, and it isn't a building, and it's not politicians, it's something else. And it employs politicians, who are just regular humans, who get to order everyone else around and take their money. How does a regular human become a politician? Well, that's the great thing about our government. It's a democracy, and that means that the people actually have the power because we get to decide who among us get to be the politicians. We get to vote. And if a politician starts doing things we don't like, 
we can just replace him with someone else at the next election. So the people that get chosen to be politicians only get to boss people around and take their money for a short time, and then they go back to being regular humans? Exactly. That sounds like a powerful position to be in. But if you get to choose who does that, I assume that politicians are always the wisest, most honest, caring and respected people among you. Well, no, not really. I wouldn't say politicians are known for being honest, or wise, or caring. And they're certainly not the most respected people among us. Come to think of it, most politicians are lying, power-hungry crooks. The ones you chose? Yeah, they're always doing things we don't like. They use taxpayers' money to enrich themselves and their friends, and they never keep their promises to voters. They've been caught stealing and lying and taking bribes, and they mostly do what the big corporations want. Yeah, they're always doing stuff like that. They're completely corrupt. They're a bunch of lying crooks. But you said that most humans know that stealing and beating each other up and killing are wrong. And you said that you have the power because you can change who's in charge. So why don't you just replace the lying, thieving, murderous, crooked politicians with some regular people? Well, we don't try to elect lying crooks. It just always turns out that way. But we have to have a government because some humans are nasty and might kill or enslave or steal. Civilization just couldn't survive without government. Let me get this straight. Because you're worried about the small number of nasty people that are willing to kill, enslave and steal, you think it's necessary for your survival to have a system where some humans among you, for a short while, get to call themselves the government, and they get to order everyone else around like slaves, and, if they want, commit mass murder overseas, using money they stole, using threats of violence. Politicians get to kill, enslave and steal, because if they didn't, someone else might? And you try to elect good, honest people to be politicians, but what happens every time is that the people you elect turn out to be corrupt, evil, lying crooks. That's your system. Yeah, that's pretty much government. I am saying, would it be considered a criminal conspiracy for individual corporations and companies and large banking institutions in America to put together the money and the technology and the raw materials to build Adolf Hitler's Nazi Germany? Would that be considered criminal conspiracy? Because in point of fact, Adolf Hitler's Nazi regime was built by American know-how, American money, General Motors, Ford Motor Company, General Electric, DuPont. Uh, you go down the line, all the major corporations in America were with Adolf Hitler in business. That's where he got the money. Because the German people were starving after the First World War. They were actually, in point of fact, starving in the streets. Their money was totally worthless. They had signed an armistice, and Germans don't usually give up in a fight. They had no alternative. They were totally broke, with no food, no ammunition, and they gave up in the First World War. Then comes this, uh, this madman named Adolf Hitler, and he's talking about how we need to clean this situation up and get back on top again. And before you know it, he's starting to put people to work. There's money coming in, building Volkswagens and, and highways. And all of a sudden, by the, about 10 years later, Germany becomes the most militaristic, most professionally trained, highly uh, trained, uh, well-fed, most uh, highly equipped standing military organization in the world with their ships on the high seas, tank fleets, submarine fleets, rockets, standing armies throughout the world, they frightened the entire world. 
where did they get the money? Somebody better trace the money, and they're going to trace it right back to New York City, Chase Manhattan Bank, Morgan Guarantee Trust, Citibank in Chicago. They're going to trace it back to all of the major financial institutions in America. They're going to trace back General Motors, Ford Motor Company, Chrysler, General Electric, Union Carbide, go down the line, all of the major corporations in America knew who Adolf Hitler was and what he was going to do, and they were supplying him with money, materials, logistics. They built Adolf Hitler's Nazi Germany here in America. And don't ever forget it. <laughs> The world is mine, nigga, get back. Don't fuck with my stack. The gauge is wrecked. About to drop the bomb, I'm the motherfucking... Nonpartisan liberty for all, and we are back. We are here with Ken Shorjan of The Daily Economist, as well as the uh, his YouTube channel, Ken Shorjan. So you can uh, look him up on YouTube and subscribe to the channel. And I, uh, we had some uh, long conversations there at the first, well, really first two hours of the show, which (laughs) is usually what we uh, go. So we're going to go a little over which I've kind of been doing anyway, at least going uh, two and a half hours as opposed to three uh, that I used to do. Um, but it, um, I, that's the thing I like about having one of the things among many of, of, you know, I think Ken does a great job, but having Ken on is that he has uh, so much information so we can get into a topic and then uh, start to have a, you know, a long conversation or get into details on something. And Ken has uh, that information. So, um, Ken, are you hearing me all right now? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. Now you're fine. Yeah, up um, until the last, uh, that last statement yeah. when you were inviting me in, you were breaking up. Yeah, I think it was uh, the music was still on for some reason. I don't know what go- – <laughs> Sometimes the cats fucking come in here and jump on the buttons. Um, oh, so Podesta blames the Russians and you blame the cats. Right. And uh, <laughs> I don't know. At times, I, I I don't know. There's still things that I'm figuring out um, with my mixer and between the computers and whatever. And I'm always trying to improve the sound. So I might mess around with some stuff. And so... Uh, I don't know, uh, but, you know, that's one of the main uh, or one of the most important things along with, of course, the content is the sound to a lot of people because once you hear high quality sound, it's hard to go back to like when I was on Blog Talk Radio and you were on when I was on there. I mean, it was passable, I thought. But a lot of people were critical, not a lot of people, but like people that had their own shows were critical of the sound because, you know, they said, well, it's not, you know, clear enough or it's not, you know, radio quality sound. And I think now the sound is really high quality, which is you can tell the difference. So I don't think I could ever go back to that uh, type of sound. But uh, even with that, I'm still trying to improve the sound because I'll listen back and I'll hear stuff that like oh this sounds like it's not where it should be and you know sometimes you can throw things off i don't know that was a waste of a couple minutes explaining that because i really didn't explain much but point being when you're trying to make something better and this happens in uh in my job my day job where i you know do reports and stuff with databases where you can break something else when you fix one thing so Anyway, not that we're breaking stuff, but you can make it worse. So there are a bunch of other things that I want to make sure we just briefly get into uh, that you had either wrote articles about or reported on. Um, You had talked about consumer spending 
as well as inflation. And one of the things that really stood out was you had mentioned eight to 10%, the real numbers, not, um, I guess the CPI numbers, um, that the real number, something like eight to 10% inflation each year. And that consumer spending is doing uh, pretty bad. Oh yeah. Um, consumer spending is, you know, since March, there, there's three real big uh, key indicators you can do, see with consumer spending. One is uh, the restaurant industry will report the volume of people, you know, coming into their places, number of seats, et cetera. And ever since March, uh, restaurant uh, volume has been been way down. The second thing, of course, is that uh, Ford, in their second quarter earnings, um, was down like 3.4 million car sales than the quarter before. And of course, the last one is uh, discretionary spending. Um, in you know, number looking at the number of retailers who go bankrupt in closed right. stores. Those are the, those are the three big ones. Um, well, in general, yeah. I think restaurants are a big teller because that's something like right now I'm trying to save money. So that's one of the things I don't do. Like I'll just buy all my food at the grocery store and maybe, you know, every couple weeks I'll, I'll get something, um, you know, or, or maybe not even that often I'll just eat, you know, food I buy from the grocery store. So I think that that's a real telltale that if restaurant uh, revenue is going down, people aren't, aren't eating out as much because they don't have the money uh, usually I think is where it's come to. I mean, I'm trying to save money, but it could be the same thing where they're trying to save money because they don't know where the economy is going. Exactly. And the thing about the, the, you know, price inflation is, is normally recorded uh, under the consumer price inflation CPI. Uh, now there is a gentleman by the name of John Williams. And you can go over to his website and if you want to find out the real numbers, um, then you want to go to shadowstats.com. What he does is he takes the numbers based on the 1980 uh, economic models, whether it's inflation, GDP, unemployment, the real models. Okay, uh, They've been changed so many times between the Clinton administration, the Obama administration, that, and, the, of course, the Federal Reserve, that they're saying right now that inflation is less than 2%. Okay, and there's a chart on an article I wrote uh, over at uh, ViralLiberty.com. Uh, Secrets of the Fed has sort of gone by wayside, but this is where I'm writing now, and it shows the 1980 official stats versus what the uh, BLS Bureau of Labor Statistics and the uh, BEA Bureau of Economic uh, uh, something um, reports, and it shows the difference between the the less than two percent price inflation to the fact that we've had ever since 2008 between uh, 8 and 10% inflation. Yeah, I There's mean, no- you, you can see it just, I mean, as a consumer, it's, it's obvious that things are going up high. I mean, it's not a small, small price increases. They do... Uh, especially supermarkets or not the supermarkets themselves, but the, the products, like they do things like, okay, you used to get like 12 ounces. Now you get 10, but the price is the same to try to trick you. But I mean, you could see that, you know, food has gone way up or, you know, even direct TV and all of these things. I mean, in my bills, everything has gone, uh, and and I had uh, mentioned this to you off here. I don't know how people afford to raise families. I I just I I don't, and and I do. You know, um, I don't do great. I'm not like a millionaire, or I'm not rich or anything. But I I do better than a large percentage of the population, just because not a lot of people make good money at all, and. I still, um, you know, I struggle to save money, uh, the, the amount of money I'm saving that, you know, I'm not struggling, but you know, if I had a family, it, it, I don't know that I could afford having a bunch of kids. They're using debt. You know, the, the two biggest, uh, uh, purchases over the past four years, you know, you know what those two purchases are education, college and cars. 
and both of them is that yeah uh, they're all are loans. well over a trillion dollars in in loans right okay the reason that americans are are making it is debt pure and simple um the the story the overall story is the well, fact I, I had thought of that sorry to interrupt but yeah i had thought of that before as well that it, you know these people they gotta be and i'm thinking in my head like there's no way because that's the one thing i've pretty much got rid of i have all my my student loans i still owe like 50 grand but besides student loans um you know, I consolidated all my credit cards uh, and settled because I had to because I, you know, had some issues with that, which we won't get into uh, that I've talked to you about. Uh, but the uh, not on air, though, uh, that I've talked to you about off air. But, yeah, I mean, I don't have the the debt uh, now neither. So I'm not using I'm strictly using cash for everything I pay for. You know what I mean? If I use a credit card, like I have one credit card left, I might spend 20 bucks on it in a month or something like that. And that's, you know, the most I'll spend. So that's uh, got to add in a lot there, too, that they're using debt. And that's why I was thinking they must be in, like, enormous debt. Yeah, when you, you know, getting back to the inflation rate, um, there was an interesting uh, indicator that some economists came out with about maybe four or five months ago, and he calls it the burrito index. And it's based on yeah, – I, I heard you talk about that on your, uh, on your podcast, but go ahead. Yeah, the burrito index is uh, the guy uh, has a local – you know, like uh, you know, in New York City, they got the hot dog stands and all that. Well, there's a right. little food truck that has burritos and – about once like or the twice carts a week. that they push around. Yeah, or with a the food, food truck, either one. Right, right. Oh, and yeah, yeah. They have the trucks too. Yeah, like it, it ice depends cream on where you're at. Type things yeah. with food. They're like ice cream trucks with food. Exactly. Um, so he would take his family. I think he had a wife and two kids. About twice a week, once or twice a week, they'd go over to uh, you know because the food truck was located maybe like a block away from their house. So they go over there and they'd go get some burritos. And he noticed over the course of the, the last 10 years, the price he paid for a burrito in 2006 and the price he paid now, okay? And he took the the, the difference between now and then and uh, divided by 10 years and came out with a percentage of uh, average median increases in price. And uh, he's showing that the inflation rate is be- just like shadow stats between 8 and 10%. Well, I did the same thing because back back in the day, I don't know if you ever go to Rubio's. Uh, I had uh, in two thousand one an ex girlfriend that actually worked there, so I've been there. I have. I don't think I've ever eaten the food, but yes. Okay, Ru- Rubio's. <laughs> I've been there. Rubio's on Tuesday afternoons after two thirty. Their fish taco. They the back two thousand six. I remember that. I used to uh, go over there and get about three of them. They were ninety nine cents a piece. Okay, normal price was a dollar fifty. Well, now they just raised prices about two months ago. The special on Friday, Friday after, or I mean Tuesday afternoons is now two dollars and twenty five cents. Okay, so yeah, Del ten, Taco. Ten years later, t- ten years later, I take the two twenty five minus ninety nine, which comes out to a dollar twenty six divided by ten years, and so the average increase, median increase is about 12.6% per year. Del Taco does that as well, and their price went up. Um, I think it. they had, like, uh, Tuesday was it, – it still is, like, their, their taco 39 cent, night. Yeah, 39 cents. Yeah, and it went up. It used to be um, – it maybe it used to be thirty nine and and now it's it went up, but I think it went from ninety nine cents to like a dollar fifty nine or something. But I mean, their costs I think are a lot lower because these are tiny tacos, and they right. might have took taken out you know like you get less meat or something because that's what those are the things that you won't even notice. So I don't even know how people can measure that. Where I mean, I guess you can if you if you pay attention. But like I was saying earlier, like something could stay the same price, but instead of getting twelve ounces, now you're getting nine ounces. Well, that, that that's that's a way of doing it. There's another. That's like the trick, you know, to trick people to think that they're not paying more. Exactly. Um, there, there's a guy who, for the last decade, what he does is 
He has a basket of 50 different items, normal items you would get, like say maybe a box of macaroni and cheese, uh, some eggs, a Coke or you know milk. He has a basket of 50 different items, and he ensures that he buys these items each year on the on the annual um, from from the same different store, you know, same two stores, and the exact same items. And he's been judging inflation, going uh, you know by the, how much it costs each year to buy the same basket of 50 goods. And so he's been monitoring uh, inflation like that. So if you think about it, wages have got, you know, the Fed gets excited when wages go up one-tenth of a percent the last month. And yet inflation is running at 8 to 10%. So you're losing money each and every year. Plus the fact that now they put in things like Obamacare. Which right. is a mandatory Which, tax. Yeah, and it's it's more money, of course, either way. But it's going. It, it also one thing that some people don't realize is that it it goes up. It each year that tax that you have to pay is going to go up. It, it doesn't uh, stay the same. Like the first year, it was really cheap, but it actually goes up. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's you know, a percentage of your income or a certain amount of money, whichever is more. And it, it's going to get up to some pretty high, you know, depending on what your salary is. But um, yeah, and of even course, even if your salary is low, you, you're still going to have to pay a lot if you don't have insurance. Sorry, of go ahead. The ramifications of that is, is that businesses, because once Obamacare got in, you know, became active, is they cut people's hourly wages so that they weren't working 40 hours. They were only working 29, which is under the 30-hour th- right, threshold to, full So time. they have to get Obamacare. So, you know, so not only are you having to pay pay this yourself, but you're you're working less hours and getting less money. And so if you're working less hours, what are you going to do? You're going to go get a part-time job. Well, here's the, the problem with the unemployment rate. Okay, they always talk about all these new jobs created and these new jobs that are filled. Well, they're all Probably. one. They're all shit jobs. They're all like certain. Uh, most of them are, are, are aren't they like uh, they're service? Wage. They're, they're like yeah. service industry jobs. And, and here's the thing: say you're you're a person who is working full time. You got your hours cut to twenty nine, so you got to get part time job. So you have two part time jobs. But instead of the unemployment rate counting you as one single person, no, they count it as two. So the the five percent unemployment rate. If you have three, say two or three part time jobs, they're going to count you as three people suddenly employed. Well, what about the the other part of it where they don't count people because they say they're not looking? I, I don't even know how you how you determine. Don't they just say if they haven't had a job in a certain amount of months, they don't count them anymore or something? Well, what like they that? do I is mean, when they when they did the census. They know they have a database with counting the number of people who are within the working years, which I think are like age 16 to 59 or 55 or 16 to 55. That's that's the labor pool. OK, and there's, say, 169 million Americans that fit into that labor pool. Well, if they've only got 65 million people working. Out of 165, that means that there's 94 million people that aren't counted because the reason they only count it is, is if you have a job or you're receiving unemployment benefits. If you're not doing one of those two and you only get those for like 99 weeks, then you're not counted. Right. There's a, that's what I mean, that there's a whole bunch of people that don't even get counted in unemployment. And, when and that's why those, it's such bullshit when they, they try to make the economy sound like – it's great if you if you listen to politicians, you would think, "Oh, damn, the economy is so fucking great." But the reality that you see, it, whether it's from you know shopping and and buying stuff, and you see the inflation, or it's knowing people that don't have jobs or not having a job yourself or whatever, that's not the reality. The only reality well, is the stock market, which they prop up. There you go. If they can get, they can program people to think that the stock market is the economy, and throw out false numbers, propaganda. The real unemployment right now is between twenty four and thirty three percent, which is Wait, worse it, than it's, the Great it's Depression. An, yeah, it's insane um, that many people to be uh, unemployed. I mean, that's ridiculous. 
yeah, you gotta you gotta wonder about all those protesters. And then you also have the sorry, not to inter- about- not to interrupt, but real quick, you also have the underemployed, the people that you know got laid off or fired and had to get because I was in this category for a while in 2011 um, to 2012 where I had to get a job because I was laid off where I made $20,000 less and was in a much lower position. So you well, have sure. you have the amount of people that are underemployed because of the economy as well. Yeah, when you count the, the employed and the underemployed, then you get a unemployment rate really – you know, a, a full-time unemployment rate of about uh, twelve to sixteen percent. Yeah, it's 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 crazy. Now, there's a lot of things to take in consideration here too. Okay, because there's a phenomenon that's going on that a lot of people, when they were laid off or lost their jobs in 2008, they became contractors. Contractors are considered self-employed. Self-employed is your own corporation you're not working for somebody you're a contract and so they also do not get counted in the unemployment rate so those 94 million people not getting uh, employed though you know maybe say a third to a quarter may actually be making money but there's contractors so they're not going to be even in the system itself i mean if you think about it i'm 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 a self-employed right I don't get counted anywhere because I don't get unemployment insurance and I don't get a a W-2. That's the requirements to be part of the uh, unemployment rate. I don't get either of those. I get a miscellaneous 1099. That's my, that's my, uh, you know, tax form. So, you know, but this, you know, the, the lack of consumer spending, one of the things that, that stands out too and why people are using debt is the, uh, let's see, what was this agency? Uh, Go Banking Rates does an annual survey of uh, 5,000 Americans, and they find out how much savings they have. And 69% in this poll, 69% of Americans have less than $1,000 in savings, period. You know, if you have a breakdown in your car, that's gone. If you have a medical emergency, it's gone. Anything, you know, $1,000 doesn't get you very far these days. No, it, it's it's... I mean, ten thousand dollars isn't a lot of money. Five thousand between, you know, a thousand and ten thousand is not like what it was twenty years ago. Yeah, here's the here's the other the other things. Six sixty percent have less than a thousand dollars in savings. Of the other thirty uh, percent or so, um, what eleven uh, percent have only between one thousand and five thousand. Four percent have between five thousand and uh, 9,900 and then 15% have more than 10,000. Those are the one percenters type thing or the, you know, 15%, the upper ones. So, you know, the vast majority of people, if, you know, we're entering into, if we're not already in a new recession, there's going to be layoffs. There's already starting. That's already starting. Uh, wages are going to, you know, halt and, uh, inflation because of all the zero interest rate policy and the expansion of the money supply, inflation is not going to stop. And you wonder why there is a worldwide shift against this, the establishment, because you know whether it's in Europe and the rise of political parties or the Bernie Sanders Donald Trump phenomenon, right. people know that something wrong. The pro- the problem is though that they they realize there's something wrong, but the way what they want or how they react to it, like following a Bernie Sanders. Um, yeah, but it's here's not a positive thing. But here, here's the problem. If you're a good person and you want to do good and you have some good ideas, do you really want to go through what the media does to you? Is it worth it to try to get a high political office? Well, again, it's all it, it's all rigged anyway, so it's not going to happen. But it, even if, even if it's not – well, I mean that's part of the rig, but would you but want even your if, personal yeah, life yeah. – and that strewn across and your reputation destroyed. Well, that's why just- if, if you're somebody who's quote unquote, I would, which I think happened to Hillary in 2008, but is selected by the powers that be, which I believe Obama was, uh, Clinton, Jimmy Carter, Clinton, the, you know, f- husband, um, 
then the government media might not be as hard on you if you're well, somebody yeah. who's. But you got to get to a position where, uh, you know, you're somebody who can be in the running for president. So you have to go through some of that at some point. See the so, fre- yeah. The, fre- the frequency change is going to be this. Okay. Um, don't take the polls. You know, the polls are a list of people of registered voters that have been around for the last 10 years and they call the same people over and over. Okay. The polls are meaningless. This whole election is going to be based on one thing, one thing only the last presidential election, only 40% of the registered voters voted. If this frequency shift demanding change in these people who haven't gotten better since 2008 or, or in the last five years, if that voting level goes up to, say, 45%, 50%, 60%, then there is not a single thing the riggers can do because they can't take you, – you can only rig a machine so much. You can rig a machine between well, 1% and 3%. I, yeah, but I, but I, mean, if, I, don't, but I don't mean that. If 5% to 10% more voters who didn't vote in the last 10 years coming out because right. they think that, they think that now is the time I've got to do something – that's going to shift everything. That's not the rigging I, I'm talking about. I'm talking about the rigging of the political party select the candidates. Then you have the media, government media, can brainwash enough of the voters into voting for a specific person. I'm talking about your candidate basically being selected before you vote type of rigging. Well, yeah, but, I mean, that that is true. That is true, but that's changing. You know, we weren't we weren't ready for a third party yet this term. But next election, guarantee we will. Um, the problem is, is that Jill Stein is not a bad candidate, but the Green Party is sort of like they're commie. They're kind of socialists. Exactly. Um, the problem with Gary Johnson and and Weld is well, Weld, is they're, they're a bunch of Republicans. Yeah, who couldn't who who couldn't get uh, you know the Republican type. a Republican nomination. I, yeah, I was they, in Massachusetts. They, they usurped it. They usurped the Libertarian Party. I was in Massachusetts when Weld was governor. He's the one who passed mandatory drug sentencing. The thousand feet within a school, you get an automatic two years. He's also for gun control. So, I mean, these guys are not libertarians, and no, I don't even not. know what the fuck a libertarian is anymore anyway. That's why I don't no, call myself you, a libertarian. There, there's one person who's a libertarian. His name is Doug Casey. And you know what Doug Casey well, did? I don't know enough about him. He got the hell out of the country. If you don't, it, it, this is one of my test questions, I guess, if I was to determine a, a libertarian. To me, if you don't believe that all drugs should be legal, um, you don't believe in self ownership because that's part of self ownership. You can put what you want in your body, then you're not a libertarian. But I don't know what the definition of libertarian is anymore. So, well, see, you see know, a, a libertarian would say, you know what, you can put poison in your body, but um, the 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 people shouldn't have to pay for your for your medical. But that's not a high. real fine. But that's they they don't pay for your medical if you have insurance. That's not a, a libertarian no, but uh, it, but position. If but if you if you have a drug overdose and you don't have insurance, you go to the emergency room. By law, they have to pay for right, it. Right, but and it gets subsidized by taxpayers. Sort of, not yeah, directly. But 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 still the same thing. That's not what a, a libertarian position on drugs is. Right. It, it, a libertarian position on drugs. It's your body. You can put what you, because based on what you're saying, you should be able to control what people eat too. Because if you eat badly, uh, you can have a heart attack and end up in the hospital, and people are going to have to pay for it well, too. Well, libertarian thing so is that the government the government really has nothing that. to do with uh, with uh, medical anyway. And if you can't afford uh, hospitals, well, it's too bad. That's that's the thing about it is libertarian. There is well, no such not, thing as a safety net. There is yeah. no such thing. Whatever you are responsible for your life, all the way. Well, what happens is though, if you live in that, if if, if society is like that, you get more charity, and you get you know because if people are even if with taxes, I don't want to get in a long conversation because we're you know almost out of time, but that these other things don't remain how they are neither. Right. But here's, you the know, thing a about lot of things change. A libertarian so. society is that, uh, 
hospitals would have to rely upon competition, not government subsidies and not HMO right. insurance. Right, but they, you'd get a it lot of – it would also be charity. It would be, be a lot of – yeah, exactly. It, w- it would be. And, and I don't know. Ron Paul had talked about how, you know, being a doctor uh, back years ago – that you didn't need insurance because it wasn't that expensive. No, in, in 1945, the government I saw, I, destroyed that whole thing. I but, saw. I saw a picture sorry. in 1945. You know how much the cost for having a baby and one night stay in the hospital was? Well, do it in you know 2016 dollars. Mm. Well, I can't do that because the HMOs have screwed up the whole thing. But I'm talking no, about no. But I mean, in to, dollars, like do- oh well, you know what the because if you say ten dollars, oh, and yeah, you know I, what I, I mean, okay. I know I know what it is. In 1945, a one night stay in the hospital and having a baby was a, was forty two dollars and forty six cents. And that would be in in two thousand sixteen. In, in, in 1945, in two thousand sixteen, the cost is eight thousand seven hundred and ninety. No, but I mean, right, right. But what I'm saying is that you no, know that's how, equivalent. That's the inflation. That's inflation. So. So it would cost eight thousand dollars. Yeah, that's still a lot of money. No, hope now it is. Yes. Yeah, but, but since the insurance covers it, they can. But you're talking because of it, inflation. But right. But I'm saying in 2016, like forty two dollars in 1945. Right. What's the yeah. equivalent of that? Well, I'd have to, I'd have to pull up. That's, uh, that's what I'm, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I mean. You know what I'm saying? That I'm saying if you, $42, what would the equivalent of $42 be in 2016? You know how they, that calculation. And that's where you can see how cheap, I'm just trying to get a, get a feel for how cheap it was. Cause $42 in 1940 might've been a lot of money. You know what I mean? I, I don't right. know. Um, so that's what I mean to try to get a feel for that. But, um, you know, so that doesn't really tell me a lot. But I do know that from, you know. Okay. What- okay. Here we go. The inflation calculator. $42 in 19. It's had 42, but let's go to 45. Uh, $42 in 1945. Is has the same buying power as five hundred and fifty eight dollars in twenty sixteen. Okay, so it would be five hundred and fifty eight dollars basically right. is what it should be, which is not right. a lot of money to have a baby. No, not no. You should not be the, right, exactly. So so point being that you should you shouldn't have to have insurance. Because right. if that's to have a baby, which is expensive, then things like just going to the doctor for a regular basic stuff or even operations you right, know, it should be pretty but here's, cheap. But here's a big here's a big difference too. In 1945, the average uh, lifespan was, I think, about 64 years. Um, and now it's what? And now it's uh, 78. Well, that's not to that. 80. That. Uh, yes. Yeah, but that that still shouldn't. But the, but the point is, is that people, as they get older, demand greater services. Right, um, but it still shouldn't like shouldn't put it up by that or much. Or scans or so, things that. So uh, so let's say lot. based on that that then then you put it up you know two hundred dollars more. I mean it shouldn't be what it is is the point that well, there's no that, way it should no it shouldn't be. But but the other side of the coin is in 1942 or 1945, uh, the concept of malpractice was uh, right. They didn't have to carry virtual. that insurance because, because when you came into when you came into a hospital, especially for something with a, a life or death ailment, you realize that you, your doctor did the best they could. If you died, right. you know, so be it. Well, that's now, how they should. They, that's the I, expectation is is that the doctor has to save you no matter what. Right, and that's and the government. That is, right, that, because they allow these lawsuits instead of the hospitals, and I'm sure they won't allow them to do this. Is to say, you know, you know, going in that this can happen and if it happens we're not liable the government won't allow that to happen so you you have these ridiculous you know insurance insurances that doctors have to carry and they just you know they totally fucked up the whole medical system but um uh, i know we basically we went over time so i just want to get to this real quick um 
because I think this is very important. You had brought up the World Health Organization uh, trying to do the Bloomberg thing, which I, I think this is going to happen in general uh, because I think the government really wants to control what you, uh, especially with them controlling insurance to an extent, what you eat and things like that. So you had said that the World Health Organization uh, had something on obesity and recommended a soda tax or something. Yeah, they're urging countries to raise taxes on sugary drinks as it blames for fueling the global epidemic of obesity and diabetes, citing it would drive down consumption, sort of like it did with smoking. And this is where you brought up that one of the reasons is because they use high fructose corn syrup and appetite, it's an appetite inducer as well. Oh, no, there, right? no, there's other things. Or there's other... Yeah, you know, sodas in the 1950s used regular cane sugar. Right, which we talked and about body, how Mexico... Body, right, but your body processes does. cane sugar, and it doesn't just turn into into fat, okay? the Then, of course, in, in Mexico, because it's not under regulations, they still use... Today, you could get, uh, at some stores... Mexican, uh, distri- you know, bottled. Yeah, in Las sodas. in Las Vegas, um, you can get the ten pack of twelve ounce uh, Pepsi's. A lot of times they're like three for twelve bucks uh, with real sugar, or you can buy the me- the glass bottle of Mexican Coke for. It was on sale at uh down the street from me on Smiths at Smiths, probably all of them for people in Las Vegas uh, for forty four cents actually. But you can buy those that have real sugar and it will say real sugar on it. Right. And the the point is, is that the entire thing actually stemmed from Fidel Castro in Cuba. Uh, in the 1970s, Coca-Cola got a new CEO and he was a former Cuban national who come over to the United States and he hated Castro so much and he wanted to get back at Castro economically. So they cut, they changed sugar uh, to try to, to destroy the sugar, um, industry in cuba yeah that's a great reason to destroy people really i want to get back at somebody so let's let's make people you know obese and and fuck with their health they didn't know it at the time in the in the thing the other thing is is you have the corn industry who wanted to you know sell more corn just like they're doing today with ethanol and so they came up with high fructose corn syrup, which your body does not process very well. Well, here's the problem. The problem is obesity has little to do with drinking too many sodas. The, the problem is, is that the World Health Organization does nothing to stem what uh, the wor- world food processors like uh, Archer Daniel Midlands, uh, ConAgra, any of those, because when they get the, the raw ingredients, okay, tomatoes, uh, wheat, any of these things, They process the food using artificial ingredients, appetite inducers like MSG. You know, whenever you look in the back of uh, uh, your label, if you see something that says natural flavors, that's MSG. That makes it sound like good, you know, natural flavors. Like, oh, it's natural. It's that word. That's what the government to do is, you know. The people were screaming about MSG, so the government said, oh, well, you can just call it natural flavors, as long as it's a small amount. But MSG is a is a uh, uh, appetite inducer. You know, you, you've so heard it will the, make you eat more. You've heard of the big joke that, you know, if you, if you eat Chinese food, after an hour you're still hungry. That's because Chinese food uses a lot of a MSG. A lot of MSG. Yeah, that it, everybody's pretty much aware of, that MSG is in um, Chinese food. Because I, I I even knew that since I was a kid because we'd talk, you know, it would come up. So I, I think that, but besides that, you know, I don't think the majority of people know that MSG is in a lot of other things. Right. But the other side of the coin is if you look in a lot of foods from macaroni and cheese to, to whatever, they use high fructose corn syrup because it's all about flavor it's no longer about nutrition well, what about the or- organic ones well that are gluten free and all that shit cuz that's what yeah, i get you know the organic is is possible but you know the the big agri con- con- companies have also al- you know allowed the government to m- allow them to put organic on 
products yeah, that aren't it's not really, really organic. Yeah, yeah. Like they change the definition of what organic is. Exactly. So what what would you um cuz I know we're, we're on time constraints, but what what would you recommend people look for um you know as far as if you're looking at products um you pretty you, you know pretty when it comes have, to this. It's not a matter of products. What you have to do is you have to go to specific stores that that sell the majority of their stuff in organics. Something like Trader Joe's, Whole Foods. Right. Well, I go to like uh, Sprouts. I don't know if that's or Sprouts. national. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, Sprouts. Uh, those Whole type Foods, of places yeah. will have probably ninety percent will be organic and without all of these things. But yeah, you know, that's you what I check do. Back, there, there's an old saying: if you can't pronounce it, then don't don't buy it. Right. But there's, like you said, there's been, um, cause there was a documentary on this, a bunch of things that are certified organic that aren't, re- I mean, they have probably some of the, uh, qualifications, but they're not like what you think they are. They're not a hundred percent organic or they don't hundred percent meet the definition. Um, so you have to be careful about some of the brands because you don't know if, they're you know um lying to you or or not or if they're getting over on you know with the uh i would guess the department of agriculture would be the ones who well yeah and and you know what you're you're not going to go 100 percent. so don't don't go in there yeah nothing no no i know but i mean you you get uh there there is a difference between the uh, the quality of organicness i guess you want to call that a word so, something so. else something else that's a misnomer too um you know there's a, it's like with models and that there's this big thing to be uh rail thin you know twiggy thin as they say right uh and then of course there's others that are obese well the 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 fact of the matter is is that in just about every scientific study it is recommended that people today not in the past but today actually carry a few extra pounds above what the the BMI, the body mass index says, because research has shown that those who carry a little bit extra weight actually live longer and have fewer overall ailments than those who are at normal BMI or less. Yeah, they're not, they're not as attractive. Yeah. But you know what the reason why? (laughs) Because in today's world, we have far more stress in all of oh, our, no shit, our entire right. lifestyle than we than they did 50 years ago when it was uh, Leave It to Beaver and you know Father Knows Best and and that we have far more stress. Well, especially if you and, if you and, know what's going on with the government. Well, and, yeah, and you got 50 but, times more stress. But yeah, but the the point is is that those who carry a little bit extra weight, de- their body deals with stress much better than somebody who is uh, you know has less body fat less uh you know less weight in that those are the people who usually can't deal with the stress i don't know that wasn't working for me i when i uh i lost some weight i was like the most i've ever weighed in my life and i was still as stressed as i was but um that might be my own issues but uh well it doesn't get rid of the stress but your body can actually handle it better yeah it it didn't feel like i was handling it better but that's just me (laughs) Oh. Mentally is different than physiol. You know, oh yeah, I might have physically been handling it better, right. but then not mentally. But um, I know we went way over, so I, I appreciate you uh, staying. I, I know there were some other things, but we can talk about that next time, mostly with gold. Um, so again, go to Ken's website, thedailyeconomist.com. dot com. Check out Ken's show where he talks uh, a lot of, about the same stuff, except. Uh, you don't have me uh, interrupting him and asking dumb questions. So you can go to uh, Ken Shorjan at YouTube and check out his show. And uh, thanks again, as always, Ken. And I know we didn't get to everything we wanted to get to, but it, as I was mentioning earlier, it's great to have Ken on because he has so much knowledge and we can get into a detailed conversation and I have, you know, the time to do that. So it's it's good to be able to uh, have somebody with uh, all that knowledge to be able to get, you know, into the details of things to help explain them better uh, to the listeners. So I hope everybody enjoyed that uh, because I enjoy those conversations. So thanks again, Ken, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks.
Yep. See you then. So that's all for tonight. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And we will be back tomorrow. Have a good night. NonpartisanLibertyForAll.com. This is a warning, another cut to move on, another beat that's so strong, hold on and I get wicked. We will defend these police officers. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get to take the law. We enforce it. But at the end of the day, each and every man can go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply.